and good evening. It is the Trinity Channel Live here on Monday, May 25th, 2015. It is Memorial Day as we celebrate Memorial Day uh, in this country, the United States of America. And it's the, the uh, evening hours here, and uh, many of us have had a long, nice, nice long weekend. Uh, thankfully, uh, it's a weekend that we can celebrate our freedom as Americans in this country because of the service that our loyal men and women have uh, done on our behalf for this cause of freedom, for the sake of freedom. And, and, and sadly, uh, we recognize those lives because they are no longer with us, because they died in battle, and uh, hence the, the name of the weekend that we celebrate, that is Memorial Day, because we do remember them and want to always have their memory in our hearts. So we are... Uh, we're looking forward to uh, celebrating many more holidays and days as of freedom. And frankly, that, that comes at a cost. And there are battles, and there are conflicts, and there are also debates. And tonight, we will have a debate. So welcome to a live uh, show production of a live debate between a Christian and a Muslim. And uh, if I haven't mentioned, my name is Chris Conway. Maybe I forgot to say that. Uh, but I will tell you that tonight we will be getting into the topic, is Jesus a prophet or is he also God? Is Jesus a prophet or is he also God? You know, Muslims believe that Jesus is one of the mightiest messengers and prophets, but that's all he is. Christians, on the other hand, believe that Jesus is the prophet because they believe he's truly human. However, Christians also know that he's more than that, that he's also God in the flesh. Sam Shamoon was born in Kuwait in an Iraqi Christian family. Although Shamoon was raised in a home which professed to belong to the Assyrian Church of the East, otherwise known as the Nestorian Church, he later on became evangelical in his Christian faith. Uh, additionally, uh, he engaged, I'm, I should back up here, I, uh, I'm trying to follow a slide here, sorry. As an adolescent, as an adolescent, uh, Shimun's faith often came under fire. His Christian beliefs were frequently challenged by those who maintained Islam as the one true religion. From these unsettling encounters, he began to dig deeply into the basics of the Christian faith he confessed, but wanted to know more about. Additionally, he engages in debates as an informed, uh, informed apologist, refuting accusations and attacks leveled by proponents of Islam against Christianity. After a thorough and critical examination of the scriptures, his ability to share the gospel and his capacity to answer skeptics' questions, specifically Muslim obje objections, increased dr dramatically. Today, Shamoon is a frequent contributor to a prominent website dedicated to challenging the Islam's, I'm sorry, the teachings of Islam. Uh, Anjum Chowdhury is a British Muslim social and political activist. He previously, was previously a solicitor and served as the chairman of the Society of Muslim Lawyers, and until it was prescribed as the spokesman for the Islamist, Islamic Islamist group, Islam for UK. He supports the implementation of Sharia law throughout the UK. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you for participating in this evening's debate. Uh, uh, we, will, we will, before we get started, uh, I, I'm going to run down the outline of the debate and mention a couple things as well. Uh, we're going to stay on topic tonight, uh, and we're also going to stay on time. Each of you will be given slots of time to speak, and certainly want to ma maintain the topic. So. If we, for whatever reason, either of you stray off topic or stray off time, we will stop and we will uh, uh, provide the appropriate correction. That is, we may have to move on to the next person or remind you what the topic is and get you back on track. So we'll continue to track that. That'll be one of my jobs tonight. Um, but let me get into this, uh, the, the structure itself after I'm done talking here with the introduction. We'll have an opening statement by our, our Muslim uh, debater. Anjum Chowdhury, and he'll have 18 minutes to do that. Then we'll have an opening statement uh, by our non-Muslim, our Christian, Sam Shamoon. He'll also have 18 minutes. Then we'll go to break. Right after we get back from break, we'll have a rebuttal. Uh, the Muslim, uh, Anjum Chowdhury, will have 12 minutes, followed by uh, Sam's 12 minutes, and then Anjum for 8 minutes, and then Sam for another 8 minutes, another break. We come back, uh, 10 minutes to cross-examine each other. Uh, each gets 10 minutes to ask the other questions on the topic and then open lines for questions. Uh, that way, we'll take calls at 248-416-1300, uh, 248-416-1300. Uh, 
And then we'll also have uh, closing statements by our Muslim debater and our Christian debater, Anjum and, and, and Sam, respectively, five minutes apiece, and that'll take us to the end of the program. Depending on how many calls we get, we may, have to, we may actually extend the program, but it all depends on how things go. So we'll, we're right now, we're slated for 90 minutes. And at this point, uh, we're going to go ahead and get that clock ready to start. And if it is ready, Anjum, you have the first 18 minutes that you can start with your introduction. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We begin in the name of Allah, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'd like to say, first of all, uh, thank you for having me on your show. It's always a pleasure to address you and address the people who are listening to this show. And there's no doubt that this is a very important question. Isa alayhi salam, or as you know him, Jesus Christ, is a prophet of God. And indeed, he is one of those who is firm, calling for tawheed, or the oneness of God to worship and to obey and to serve none but Allah. Indeed, all of the prophets of God said, La ilaha illallah, that there is no one truly worthy to be worshipped except for Allah. And we can see, in fact, that as all of the prophets of God, he was a Muslim. The word Muslim is the one who submits to the commands of God. And uh, I want to say at the outset that my invitation is here for all of the Christians who are listening and even the people who are not Muslim but of other faiths, to embrace Islam. Embrace Islam before death embraces you. Embrace the fastest growing ideology and religion and way of life in the world today. And it is a simple thing to do to do because you merely declare your own shahada, which is Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. That I bear testimony that there is no one truly worthy of worship or obedience or following except for Allah. And I bear testimony that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is his messenger. And of course, by saying this, you will reject that Allah has parents or children. You reject to worship anything other than him, whether that be an idol or a cross or indeed an animal like a cow or any other statue. And indeed, Islam is the only true monotheistic belief in the world today. So my, my invitation is there. And uh, what I want to do at the outset as well is say to you that the criteria that we refer to must be based upon something which is authentic. And obviously, as a Muslim, we do believe that uh, the original Injil, or what you term the Bible, has been preserved in the divine tablet in the heavens. But it so happened that Allah did not decide to preserve it on this earth. And therefore, what you have in your hand, which you call the Old or the New Testament, has been doctored, has been changed, and is not reliable anymore. And therefore, I cannot reliably refer to that for what, in fact, Isa alayhi salam or Jesus really said about himself and his own call. And therefore, I will be rel relying, obviously, on the inimitable Quran and the preserved traditions, the sayings, the actions, the consent of the Messenger Muhammad uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So this is something that I must say at the outset. Uh, I will not be referring to the Bible. I don't think it's authentic. So whatever Sam may say about that, you know, it was never preserved. It was never written down uh, contemporaneously. Uh, there are Gospels according to various people. We can talk about those and how those aren't authentic as well, you know, a little bit later, inshallah. But I think the most important thing is really to relate to uh, those people who don't know the true story of uh, Jesus, what in fact is mentioned about him in the Quran, and indeed in the uh, uh, traditions of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is what I want to start out uh, from. You know, it's a well-known um, uh, uh, story, in fact, uh, an authentic story, narrated by Ibn Hisham and Ibn Hisak and many of the uh, people who wrote about the Sirah, that in fact the Messenger Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent his own companions, at the head of which was Jafar bin Abi Talib, uh, anhu, to the Abyssinian king in his own time, the Najashi. And in fact, when they entered into their own court and their own um, uh, monks and their own religious people were there, they uh, related to them exactly what was taught to them by the Messenger Muhammad uh, And in fact, they recited to them certain verses from chapter Maryam. And I want to read these verses to you because really this explains some of the, of the truth about Isa alayhi salam in the, in the word of Allah, which is the Quran. This is Kalamullah Hakiki, the actual word of Allah, which has been preserved. 
And we can read from chapter 19, verse 16 onwards, Allah said in the Quran, in the explanation of the meaning, and mention of Muhammad in the book, the story of Mary, Maryam, when she withdrew from her family to a place towards the east. And she took in seclusion from them a screen. Then we sent to her our angel, and, we, and he represented himself to her as a well-proportioned man. Obviously, that was Jibra'il, alayhi salam. She said, indeed, I seek refuge in the most merciful from you. So leave me, if you should be fearing of Allah. He said, I'm only the messenger of your Lord to give you news of a pure boy. She said, how can I have a boy while no man has touched me and I have not been unchaste? He said, thus it will be. Your Lord says, it is easy for me. We will make him a sign to the people and a mercy from us. And it is a matter already decreed. So she conceived him and she withdrew with him to a remote place. And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She said, oh, I wish I had died before this and was in oblivion forgotten. But he called her from below her. Do not grieve. Your Lord has provided beneath you a stream. I shake towards you the trunk of the palm tree. It will drop upon you ripe, fresh dates. So eat and drink and be contented. And if you see from among humanity anyone say, indeed, I have vowed to the most merciful abstention, so I will not speak today to any man. Then she brought him to her people, carrying him. They said, O oh Mary, you have certainly done a thing unprecedented. O oh sister of Aram, your father was not a man of evil, nor was your mother unchaste. So she pointed to him. They said, how can we speak to one who is in the cradle, a child? And Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, he said, Indeed, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. And he has made me blessed wherever I am and has enjoined upon me prayer and zakah as long as I remain alive and made me dutiful to my mother. And he has not made me a wretched tyrant. And peace be upon me the day I was born and the day I will die and the day I am raised alive. Because indeed he will return. That is Jesus, the son of Mary, the word of truth about which they are in dispute. Obviously referring to you. It is not befitting for Allah to take a son. Exalted is he. When he decrees an affair, he only says to it, be, and it is. So this is what Allah said. He said, kun fayakun. He said, be, and it is. It is easy for Allah. And Jesus said, and indeed Allah is my Lord and your Lord. So worship me. That is a straight path. Then the factuous differed concerning Jesus from among them. So woe unto those who disbelieved from the scene of a tremendous day. How clearly they will hear and see the day they come to us, but the wrongdoers today are in clear error. And warn them, O Muhammad, of the day of regret, when the matter will be concluded, and yet they are in a state of heedlessness, and they do not believe. Indeed, it is we who will inherit the earth, and whoever is on it, and to us they will be returned. So those are the verses from chapter Maryam explaining clearly about uh, the birth and uh, the uh, miraculous birth indeed of Isa alayhi salam and how he spoke in his cradle. And indeed there are, uh, if there's information there that did not reach you via what you have in your hand today, but th that was informed to us by Allah uh, in the Quran uh, via the angel Jibra'il alayhi salam, the angel Gabriel, to the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Now in terms of the uh, actual story of Jesus or Isa alayhi salam, I want to, to refer to something authentic, which is uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, one of the great scholars of Islam, when he talked about the Christian belief. And here I want to summarize what in fact the Muslims believe and what is the truth about the story of Jesus? Because we have to set this out at the beginning. If you don't go away with anything apart from the truth about Jesus, then that will be something which I'll be pleased about. And uh, inshallah, Allah will guide those to whom he put the spark in their heart to embrace Islam amongst you. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah and all of the scholars are agreed that this is the real life, in fact, of Jesus. He said that the students of Isa alayhi salam struggle for the truth and were persecuted because of this. In other words, all of the prophets were persecuted because they uh, called for the truth. Isa started his call and um, 
beginning with his own people, Bani Israel, the children of Israel. And of course, they accused him of lying, of being a magician, etc. And they decided that he must be killed and indeed crucified. And they even decided on a day that they will do this. And on that day, they crucified who they thought was Jesus. And that was the custom, by the way, at that time to burn the body. And they did this as well. On that day, the Roman leader didn't permit anyone to attend the crucifixion. And it was said after that he had been burnt and crucified. And some people saw someone on a cross, but they did not know who it was. And they were told it was Jesus. They just saw someone moved and burnt, but they did not know who it was. They didn't see Jesus and, uh, um, um, or rather, they, did, they couldn't see because it was done from a distance. And uh, this is what uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah informs us. And in fact, the story continues that a man called Saul, who in fact didn't like Jesus or in fact was in fact an enemy of him, uh, against him and wanted to kill him, and he indeed declared war against Christianity, one day said that he heard a voice calling him for a certain belief. And uh, if he did believe, then God would forgive him and, uh, and therefore he accepted this uh, particular call. And he said this was a miracle and he changed his deen and then he became poor. He changed his religion and became poor. And he went to the disciples and they doubted him. The only one in fact who accepted him was Barnabas. And he became one of the followers and he became one of the people among the disciples. The people started to see him as a leader indeed of Christianity. And in fact, before Saul became Paul, no one claimed the Trinity or Jesus was the son of God. Rather, all of this came fabricated via Paul. And Saul, who became Paul, said that he saw the light as he went to Nazareth. And he said that Jesus was not a man or a prophet, but rather he was part of God. And the disciples really never believed that he was crucified. But Paul continued to insist on it. And he even said he witnessed it. Rather, the one crucified, as we know, was the one who was supposed to be guarding Isa alayhi salam, as opposed to Jesus himself. And then when Paul started to say this, the people did not um, uh, challenge him and uh, as he was supposed to be a student of Isa alayhi salam. Although some of the disciples tried to resist and maintain the true teachings of Christianity, what we find is that after a century, they uh, succeeded, but after a century, uh, this was more or less lost, the true teachings of Jesus. And we continue with uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. He said that 300 years later, uh, as we know, there was a meeting where at that time, uh, one Caesar who wanted to write a new religion came about, and this was in uh, uh, Constantine. And we know about this Council of Nicaea where they gathered together the so-called scholars of Christianity and a meeting was held. And in fact, this is where they accepted a new deen, a new religion, a mixture between the teachings of Paul and the teachings of Isa salam, Jesus, and as well the worship of the stars, which was the worship of this particular individual who was uh, King Constantine. And they started to enforce this uh, new package of Christianity on the people. And they changed the Sabbath to a Sunday. They allowed people to eat pork. They created the patriarch, a class system. They, uh, uh, if you like, appointed figures in charge, built uh, new uh, churches, over 12,000 churches. And obviously we have, therefore, a new religion, not the religion, in fact, of Isa alayhi salam or Jesus. Uh, how long do I have left, by the way? Hello? Four and a half minutes left, I'm sorry. Four and a half minutes, yeah, because I, I, my timing is not here. I can't see it. Okay, so that is the true real uh, religion, in fact, and the true story of uh, Jesus, as we believe as Muslims. And I want to say that at the outset, and we relate as well the story in uh, chapter Maryam. And I just want to read you a few other verses of the Quran, which talk about the fact that Jesus was, in fact, a Muslim prophet. And he was not God. And in fact, this is a stern warning. If we look in the Quran in chapter Nisa 171, Allah mentions, O people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion or utter anything concerning Allah but the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, his word that he sent to Mary, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say three. Desist 
it is better for you. Allah is one God, for exalted is he above having offspring. He is all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth. Allah is sufficient disposer of affairs. If we look as well in chapter Ma'idah verse 17, Allah said in the explanation of the meaning of the Quran, they have indeed disbelieved those who say Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary. Say, O Muhammad, who then can do anything against Allah if he had will to destroy the Messiah, son of Mary, his mother and everyone on earth? Allah is the kingdom of the heavens. Allah is the kingdom of the heavens and the earth and all that is in between them. He creates what he wills. Allah is able to do all things. And as well in chapter 5 verse 72, as well in chapter Amaida. Surely they disbelieve who say Allah is Messiah, son of Mary. The Messiah himself said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever joins other gods with Allah, for him Allah has forbidden paradise. His abode is in the fire and the evildoers shall have no helpers. And as well in chapter 573 in the following verse, surely they disbelieve those who say Allah is one of three. There is only one God. If they will not desist from what they say, a painful torment shall befall the disbelievers among them. And in the following verse, will they not rather repent to Allah and seek his forgiveness? Allah is forgiving, merciful. Are you still with me? Yes, you have two minutes have left. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yes. The Messiah, son of Mary, was no other than a messenger before whom similar messengers passed away. His mother was a saintly woman. They used to eat food, see how we make the revelations clear to them, and see how they are deluded. That is in chapter 575. And then Allah continues in the Quran, Say, O Muhammad, will you worship besides Allah that which has no power to harm or benefit you? Allah is the hearer and the knower. And then say, O people of the book, commit no excesses or falsehood in your religion. And do not follow the vain desires of folk of old who erred, led many astray and strayed from the even path. Those who disbelieved from among the children of Israel were cursed by the tongue of David and Jesus, the son of Mary. That was because they disobeyed and used to transgress. And uh, there are many other verses, in fact, from the Quran talking about this. But um, what I want to say to you is uh, at the beginning, uh, embrace Islam, accept Jesus. And in fact, all of the prophets of God, including the final messenger, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, declare your shahada. There is no God except for one, which is Allah. And, uh, you know, it is not logical and irrational and indeed not from the revelation to say three is one and one equals three. So that is my introduction. May Allah guide us all to the truth and help us to uh, embrace it. You, you, uh, you, you're ahead of schedule by about 40 seconds, but uh, we'll, we'll move on if you'd like to, if you'd like to do that. Uh, well, uh, I'd just, like to, say, I'd just yeah. like to say one last thing really. You know, if you look in uh, America and you look in Britain, Islam is, in fact, the fastest growing ideology and religion. You know, in Britain, they say, you know, by the year 2050 or 2070, you know, the Muslims will start becoming the majority. And there's a lesson in that for you, that people are embracing the truth. They realize that Islam agrees with our nature as human beings and uh, agrees with, our, uh, you know, okay. with everything. Thank you. We're going to move on. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so we're just sorry to interrupt, but we got to move on. I, I appreciate what you're saying. We'll yeah. definitely give you more chance to talk. We're going to reset the clock. Sam, we'll start talking. We'll start the clock when you start talking. Okay, and let me know when, then, you know. Yeah, you're good. I'll give you a hand. So should I begin? You should begin. Okay. <clears throat> Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I beg the Father, for the sake of his beloved Son, my Lord and Savior, to anoint the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my mind, to speak clearly, to speak accurately, to speak coherently without error, by the power of his sovereign, glorious, majestic Holy Spirit, so that tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ, his beloved Son, will be exalted. And I beg the Father to use me <clears throat> by the power of his Holy Spirit <clears throat> to bring everything under the feet of Jesus that opposes him. Every false prophet, every false religion to be brought under the precious and glorious feet of Jesus Christ. And that every heart will be convicted by the Spirit to bow the knee, including Enjem's knee. And every tongue confess, including Enjem's tongue, that Jesus Christ is Lord, even Lord over Muhammad, to the glory of God the Father. So I beg the Father for that grace. That said, I do thank Enjem for agreeing to have this discussion with me. This is the first time I'm discussing with this gentleman. And I actually like him quite a lot because he's brutally honest. 
he's not ashamed to present Islam as it is. Other Muslims, unfortunately, try to sugarcoat Islam and make it into something it's not. I can say that this man is not ashamed of his religion. In fact, I encourage him to continue to speak about Islam because the more people hear about Islam from his mouth, the more people will run away from Islam and embrace Jesus as the Lord and Savior. All praise be to the risen Son of God. Now, that said, I want to just quickly say something to my dear friend. <clears throat> when you want to examine the life of Jesus Christ, you need to go to the earliest historical sources in our possession. No serious scholar, no serious historian, be he atheist, Jew, agnostic, or Christian, even considers the Quran as an accurate source of information on the life of the historical Jesus. If I want to know about Muhammad, I'll turn to the Quran. But if I want to know about the historical Jesus, I need to turn to the earliest, oldest documents in our possession. And all these scholars agree the oldest documents in our possession that comes from the lifetime of Jesus and or his followers are the New Testament documents, specifically the Gospels. Related to that, since my debate is with a Muslim, I'm not de debating an atheist, <clears throat> I'm going to actually show him what his own book says about my scripture. And I want to qualify and nuance my appeal to the Quran and the traditions of Muhammad. I do not believe the Quran is God's word, nor do I believe Muhammad is a prophet. However, he believes that. Therefore, I'm going to show him what his own sources say about the incorruptibility of my scriptures. He just said that the original Injil exists with Allah in heaven, but that the Injil on earth has been corrupted, has been tampered with. That's actually contrary to the teaching of his own Quran. Again, for the sake of time, because the topic is not about the incorruptibility of the Bible versus the corruption of the Quran. So I'm going to have to do this in passing because the topic is, did the historical Jesus and did his followers proclaim that Jesus Christ is more than a prophet, that he's the divine son of God, God in the flesh? So again, I have to be real quick because time is winding down, trusting the grace of God's spirit to grant me clarity of thought to do justice to the topic. Surat Al-Maida, chapter 5, verses 46 to 47. This is what it says. <clears throat> And we sent following in their footsteps, Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah between his hands. Now my friend here, my brother in humanity knows the Arabic. Musaddiqin lima bayna yadehi. Sadaqa lima bayna yadehi. Meaning the Torah between his hands, the Torah that he had access to. The Quran says that Jesus confirmed the scriptures that he had access to. Since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, <clears throat> we have copies of the Old Testament that were written before the time of Christ showing that the scriptures that Jesus had access to are identical to the scriptures we have today. So if the Quran is true, then the Old Testament scriptures remain incorruptible because Jesus confirmed the veracity of those scriptures. But if my opponent is going to argue that these scriptures are corrupted, then that means Allah deceived Jesus to testify that the books that he had access to were actually incorruptible when in reality they were corrupt. So I'm going to let him solve this dilemma that he's placed himself in. But let's go on and see what it says about the gospel. And we gave to him the gospel, wherein is guidance and light. Not was, wherein is, addressing Muhammad's contemporaries, addressing the Christians at Muhammad's time, wherein is guidance and light, confirming the Torah between his hands. Sadaqa lima bayna yadehi, that Jesus had access to. So not only Jesus, but the gospel given to Jesus confirms the Torah, the scriptures that came before Jesus. As a guidance and admonition, unto the God-fearing. So let the people of the gospel judge according to what God has sent down therein. Here's my question for my opponent tonight. How in the world could the Christians of Muhammad's time judge by the gospel given to Jesus if you're right that gospel had been corrupted? More importantly, are you trying to convince the audience that your prophet exhorted Christians to judge by a corrupted gospel? If so, how can we trust your prophet? But then on the flip side, if I do as your prophet exhorts me to do and judge by the gospel that the Christians of Muhammad's time had access to, well, the only gospel they had access to is the same gospel in my possession in the New Testament. And if I judge Islam according to that revelation, Muhammad turns out to be a false prophet and an antichrist because he denied that God is the father and that Jesus is his beloved son. So damn if you do and damn if you don't, welcome to the wonderful world of Islamic Dilemma 101. But again, another one. Chapter 7, verse 157 of the Quran. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet of the common folk, whom they find. Pay attention to this, Anjum. This is your own source that you believe in it. I don't, you do. So you're going to have to deal with this. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet of the common folk, 
whom they find written down with them in the Torah and the Gospel. You said the Gospel is with Allah. So what they have on earth is something corrupt. This verse says, you don't know what you're talking, talking about, my friend. It says, written down with them in the Torah and the Gospel. So the true Gospel wasn't in heaven. It was on earth in the possession of the Christians of Muhammad's time. Now I'm going to ask you to tell us what that Gospel is. But I'm going to give you a little help. I'm going to show you what Ibn Ishaq said in Sirat Rasulullah in identifying that gospel for us. Here's what he said. Sirat Rasulullah, I'm quoting the English translation by Alfred Ghulameh, pages 103 to 104. So you don't need to guess. One of your earliest sources on Muhammad's life tells you what the gospel is. Among the things which have reached me <coughs> about what Jesus, the son of Mary, stated in the gospel, which he received from God for the followers of the gospel in applying a term to describe the apostle of God. Now, Ibn Ishaq erroneously thinks that the gospel of Jesus contains a prophecy of Muhammad. On the contrary, and I challenge you to debate me whether Muhammad was prophesied by the prophets who came before him. Now, with that said, here's what he quotes. It is extracted from what John, pay attention, Anjum. It is extracted from what John, the apostle, set down for them when he wrote the gospel for them from the testament of Jesus son of Mary according to your earliest extent biography on the life of Muhammad which was edited by Ibn Hisham and then when Ibn Hisham edited Ibn Ishaq's biography he left this intact meaning that it met his approval John wrote down the gospel of Jesus and here he cites John chapter 15 verses 23 to chapter 16 verse 4 verse 1 so here, your own source identifies John's gospel as the inscripturation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So please, do not try to say that your sources deny the incorruptibility, preservation, and availability of the gospel of Jesus. That's not what your Quran or your prophet or your earliest sources taught. Now that I've got out, gotten that red herring out of the way, let's now come to the heart of the matter, the meat of the matter. Remember, Enjim said that Jesus is a Muslim. <clears throat> If that's so, that means Jesus and his followers affirm Tawheed. And by Tawheed, I mean, because again, Anjum is a Salafi, he believes in a threefold division of Tawheed, and he divides Tawheed in three categories. The oneness of Allah's sovereignty, right? The oneness of the worship of Allah, that only Allah is to be worshipped, and the unity or the oneness of Allah's names and attributes. Now, if Jesus was a Muslim, and his followers were Muslims, that means they would not ascribe to Jesus the exclusive sovereignty of Allah to Jesus. They would not ascribe the very worship given to Allah to Jesus. They would not ascribe the unique names and characteristics of Allah or God to Jesus. But lo and behold, they actually do the very opposite. The very names, the very titles, the very sovereignty and worship of God is ascribed to Jesus, not just by his followers, but by Jesus himself, based on the earliest records on the life of Jesus, which your own Quran says, happen to be preserved and inspired by your deity. Now I challenge that assertion. Your God is not my God. Your God is a counterfeit. The God revealed in Jesus, as found in the New Testament, He alone is the true God, and He's not the Allah that you worship. So I invite you to repent of your falsehood and embrace Jesus, your only hope of salvation. Now let's go into the arguments. <clears throat> Did Jesus and His followers ascribe the unique worship, sovereignty, attributes, and names of God to Jesus? Let's see. According to your Quran and Jum, and I'm going to ask you to answer this question quickly. Please don't try to drag in answering this because my time is fleeting. And as you can see, I'm trying to speak very fast to cover a lot of ground. Chapter 57, verse 3 of your Quran. It says, Allah, He is the first and the last, the outward and the inward. He has knowledge of everything. He is al awwal wal akhir, the first and the last. According to Tawheed, this is a name that belongs only to Allah. Now the Bible agrees actually. The Bible agrees here with the Quran, or I should say the Quran agrees with the Bible. This is a name that only belongs to God. So here, I'm going to read something and tell me if you agree this is speaking about God. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17, 18. Revelation 1, 17, 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I were, uh, I were dead. Then he placed his right hand upon me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and last. I am he who lives. Now, Enjim, do you agree that what I just read from the New Testament, the one speaking, saying, I am the first and the last, and he who lives. That is God. Do you agree real quickly? Can he answer? You're smiling? Yes? Did he say yes? 
I think we're coming to the crossfire a little bit later, Sam. Let's okay, fine. That. Well, anyway, okay, that smile, I'll take that smirk as a yes. Okay, my friend. Well, let me show you what your God said about himself. I am the first and last. I am he who lives. Though I was dead, look, I am alive forever, forevermore. Here Jesus says, he is the first and the last who lives, who died. Clearly, taking the very name of Allah, the very name of the God of the Bible, and applying it to himself. There's no way around this, my friend. These are the earliest documents coming from those who knew Jesus. Unlike Muhammad, who came 600 years later, and Jesus claimed the very title that even the Quran says can only be ascribed to God. Second argument. According to the Quran, who is the resurrection and the life? Well, you don't need to guess. Let me read it for you. Chapter 22, verses 6 to 7 of the Quran. Notice, I'm quoting the Quran because you believe in it. And I'm showing you that according to your Quran, the things that Jesus said and his followers said of him could not be said if he was a Muslim prophet. But glory be his name, he is no Muslim prophet. He's the God of all Muslims, the God of Muhammad. Chapter 22, verses 6 to 7. This is what your Quran says. That is because God, or Allah, he is the truth, al-haq, and gives life to the dead. So who is the truth? Allah, and he gives life to the dead. And is powerful over everything. And because the hour is coming, no doubt of it, and God shall raise up whatsoever is within the tombs. Notice, Allah is the truth, gives light to the dead, and at the hour, the last day, He will raise up the dead from their tombs. Lo and behold, let's see what Jesus Christ, our Lord, said about Himself. The Gospel of John, the very Gospel that Ibn Ishaq said, was the Gospel that John wrote down for the followers of Jesus, based on the revelation that God had given to Jesus. John 5, verse 21, and verse 25, and verses 28 to 29. John 5, verses 21, 25, verses 28 to 29. For as the Father raises the dead, right there, Jesus cannot be a Muslim. He calls God the Father. But your Quran, in chapter 5, verse 18, in chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran, in chapter 19, verses 88 to 93 of your Quran, it says Allah is a father to no one. He's not the father of the Jews or the Christians, and Jesus is not a son. The highest relationship you can have with him is a slave-to-master relationship. But the historical Jesus said that the true God is the Father, meaning that Jesus' teachings condemns the Quran as a false revelation. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. But your Quran says that's something that Allah does. Allah gives life, and Jesus says, I, the Son, give life. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour, remember what the Quran said? The hour is coming and is now here. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, not the voice of Allah, not the voice of Muhammad, not the voice of Ibn Taymiyyah, the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves, our graves, <clears throat> will hear the voice of the Son of God, His voice, and come out. Jesus just said that at the last hour, those in the graves will be hearing the voice of the Son of God, and He will give the life and raise them up. But according to the Quran, this is something that only God does and not a creature. Therefore, Jesus is claiming to be God in the flesh, although He's not the Father or the Holy Spirit. But it goes beyond that. One of the names of Allah, according to the verse I read, is that He's Al-Haq, the truth. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's claiming the very names of God according to the Quran. This is a violation of Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. And you know what I'm talking about, if he's a Muslim. But thank God he's no Muslim. He's the divine son of God, the God of all flesh, the God of Muhammad, the God of all Muslims. Third argument, showing that Jesus claimed to be God. According to your Quran, Allah possesses absolute sovereignty over the entire creation. This is Tawheed al rububiyah <clears throat> Rubia. Oh, wait, how many? You better repent. Is that Middle Eastern time or American time? Anyway, <laughs> according to your Quran, chapter 3, verse 180, and to Allah belongs the inheritance of the heavens and the earth. He owns the heavens and the earth. Chapter 3, verse 189. To God belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. So he is the heir of creation and the one who holds sovereignty over creation. And Surah 25, 2 says this. To whom belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth? And he has not taken to him a son and has no partner in the kingdom. So according to the Quran, Allah alone is the sovereign king of creation in the air. Lo and behold, here's what the Lord Jesus says about himself. Matthew 28, 18. 
Then Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority, all sovereignty has been given to me in heaven and earth. Mark 12, 6 to 8. Who's the heir of creation? Your Quran says Allah. Jesus says, it's me, the beloved son. Mark 12, 68. Having yet his one well-beloved son, he sent him last to them. This is Jesus speaking about himself. One beloved son, he sent the son last to them. <clears throat> they will revere my son. They will honor my son, which is what God expects you to do. You better honor and revere the son of God. Otherwise, you have no hope of salvation. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. The beloved son of God is the heir and he possesses absolute sovereignty over all creation. Now, because my time is almost up, I'm going to have to be quick with this. So Jesus is the life, the resurrection, the truth, the one who gives life to the dead, raises the dead at the last hour from their graves just by the power of the sound of his voice. So with the minute left, left <clears throat> let me talk about the worship of Jesus. John 5, 22, 23. The Father judges no one. This is, again, Jesus speaking of God as the Father which is anathema to Islam, but has committed all judgment to the Son. For what reason? That all men should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Jesus demands of you and even demanded of your prophet, but it's too late for him. But there's still hope for you. You must honor the Son the same way you honor God the Father. So however you honor the God, God the Father, Jesus says, you must give me that same honor. Otherwise, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Your prophet failed to honor Jesus as a son, so he's now under the feet of Jesus. But there's still hope for you. Repent before the day of the Lord comes upon you. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. We have uh, gone through our first introductions, 18 minutes apiece. And we will now go into a break, and we'll be right back, and we'll be going into our rebuttal from our Muslim debater, Anjum Chaudhary. So stay with us and uh, keep the number handy. 248-416-1300 because we will be taking your calls later. Come right back to us with us after this brief break. Live debates with Shadid Lewis versus Dr. Tony Costa. The first debate will take place on Saturday, June the 13th at 12 noon. The topic, the crucifixion, truth or fiction. The second debate will take place on Saturday, June the 13th at 2 p.m. The topic, the Quran, Word of God or Man. The location, University of Michigan, Dearborn Campus, CASL Building, Auditorium, 1030. Hosted and moderated by Rachel Christie. Organized by the Center for Religious Debate. Also, the debates will be live on trinitychannel.com. Hello, I'm Dave Agemo, former state representative, former fighter pilot, former airline pilot, and I'm here at the ABN Trinity Studios to encourage you to read, watch, and donate to ABN and the Trinity Channels. This ministry has to go out throughout the world. The ministry right now is being presented to eight different states, New Zealand, Australia, and reaching about 21 million people. I want to encourage you because the media today is what's most important. The enemies of Christianity, the enemies of the United States, i.e. radical Islam, are using every means they can to recruit in the United States of America. We need to use ABN and the Trinity Broadcasting Network to counter that. So please, folks, get involved, donate, watch, and tell everyone you know what you've seen on these programs, because these programs are very important. They'll give you the information that you need to counteract the radical Islam that's occurring in the United States today. Be with us. Be a partner. We appreciate it. And we are back, and we'll get right into it. We've uh, reset the clock. Anjum, you have 12 minutes, and we'll start the clock with your rebuttal as soon as you start talking. Yes, um, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. Uh, I think we admitted a couple of things that we need to refer 
to the Quran and the Sunnah. I'm very happy that you laid this foundation as well as one of the planks of your argument because I'm going to be referring to the Quran and Sunnah rather a lot today. And uh, we're going to deal with the Gospels as well a little bit later. But um, let me just begin by saying that uh, you can't be selective, you see, from what you quote from the inimitable word of God, which is the Quran, the actual word of Allah as revealed to uh, the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You can't pick and choose. This is not strawberry season, Sam. And obviously we have to take as well the hadith as the explanation and the elaboration of what is mentioned in the Quran. So let's see exactly what Allah tabarak wa ta'ala actually says about Isa alayhi salam. Allah said in the Quran, for example, about uh, the nuzul of Isa, the returning of Isa alayhi salam in chapter 4, 159. Allah said here in the Quran, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim wa in wa in min ahli al-kitab illa la yu'minanna bihi qabla mawtihi." He said, "And uh, there is none of the people of the book but must believe in him before his death." And obviously, we're talking now about Isa ibn Maryam. Now, if you look at the Asbab al-Nuzul, which I'm sure you know what that means, the circumstances of revelation of this particular ayah in the Quran, it is narrated in Bukhari from Sa'id bin Musayyib, uh, rahimahullah, that the messenger of Muhammad uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, by the one who has my soul in his hand, definitely Isa alayhi salam will return and will judge between the people and will be just for the truth. He will destroy the cross, he will kill the pigs, and there will be no more jizya. This is what he said. So this is one verse and the explanation from the hadith, from what the Prophet wasallam said. Let's have a look at another one, shall we? We see, for example, here, and this is when uh, a group of Christians came to him, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and asked what he believed about Isa alayhi salam. And he said, I believe he is a sign of the hour and that Allah will make him come and address and challenge you whether he is the son of God or not. And indeed, Allah mentions in the Quran in chapter 43, verse 61, A'udhu billahi wa ilmun li sa'ati. He, said, he said that Isa will be a sign of the hour. So he is as well here. Uh, mentioned as a sign of the hour. That is the, if you like, circumstances of that particular verse. And we can see as well here in chapter 3, verse 46, and the circumstances of this one as well have been mentioned by Ibn Zaid, that uh, the Prophet said that Jesus will address the people in his cradle, and you speak to them again when he is quite old as well. And um, uh, here Allah mentions in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim he said here, and he will speak to the people in the cradle, in manhood, and he, he will be one of the righteous. So obviously, Isa alayhi salam, we believe, will return because it is agreed that he was taken up by Allah when he was quite young and he will address the people even in his old age. So I think this is important to understand. And... Um, you know, whilst we're talking about the messengers of Allah, I will say to you that all of the messengers of Allah essentially had the same message to call the people to Tawheed. And that means al ifrad al lillah to worship Allah exclusively, not to attribute sons or daughters or parents or cousins to him. Secondly, to do tabliq, to command good and forbid evil, to convey the message, to carry da'wah. Number three, to make bayan, to elaborate and clarify the answers to the questions that the people have to guide the people, to give them the hidayah, uh, not for their own benefit or interest, but rather to guide them to worshipping Allah. And also to be an example and role model to follow, Qudwa wala uswa. And as well to keep uh, reminding them uh, to make this taskir, and uh, to be leadership for mankind, and as well to be witness over their own affairs. And we can see that Jesus, or Isa alayhi salam, was no different in that respect. Now, um, you mentioned uh, quite a few times, John, and um, I have a couple of things to say about that, really. You know, uh, you, you quote John as if, uh, you know, he's authentic 
and everybody agrees. I mean, I can mention a few things to you. Uh, this is from your own uh, people, in fact. F.F. Bruce, a uh, conservative scholar in the 1990s, said about John that his depiction of Jesus is like Shakespeare in Julius Caesar. He said he put his words in his mouth. Uh, Craig Lomberg said the same thing about him. Uh, R. Balcom, uh, in 2006, one Scottish uh, Christian said that all the scholars agree that John uh, is responsible. Um, uh, rather, uh, rather, John is reported, uh, and it's an, it's an extensive interpretation and version. It's uh, really a very far-fetched version, if you like, of the story of Isa, alayhi salam that uh, this is not authentic, rather it's been invented. And you can see as well, Professor Stadlin, he said the entire Gospel of John was written by one of his students of the Alexandrian school, one sect in the second century, rejecting this Gospel and everything that was attributed to John. And in the Encyclopedia of Britannica as well, it says, as for the Gospel of John, it's undoubtedly fabricated. It's all the want, it's all the wanted to pitch two of the disciples against one, namely uh, St. John and St. Matthew. And obviously we can go on and on about uh, how this particular gospel is inauthentic. You know, even according to your own sources, let alone the fact, as I've already said, the Bible is not, not written down contemporaneously. You cannot rely upon it, uh, Sam. This is the reality, the Old and the New Testament. There are so many misconceptions, so many uh, contradictions, so many fallacies. You know, and uh, we're going to come on to that, inshallah, a little bit later. But uh, as part of my rebuttal, I can tell you a little bit about uh, the Gospels uh, and I can tell you a little bit about what in fact uh, is said about um, uh, Jesus, even though, you know, you talk about him being um, the Son of God and him in fact being God. But you know, there's no one who ever said, or rather there's no mention in the Old or the New Testament ever that Jesus said that I am God or indeed he said, worship me. And you know that, Sam, and I know that, and all the Christians know that. So where did it come from? You know, to say you're the son of God was a very useful metaphor at that time. And you can see everybody is the son of God if you refer to what you have in your hand. In Samuel 8, 13 to 14, God says, Suleiman, Solomon is his son. He said, I will be his father and he shall be my son, talking about Solomon. In uh, Exodus 4, 22 to 23, we see that even... Uh, Israel, uh, Yaqub is his son as well. He said that, um, uh, let my son go, that he may serve. Talking about Israel, my firstborn son. If you look at the Psalms 89, 26 to 27, even the prophet Dawood, David, is his son. He said, also I'll make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. And you can see even the angels are the sons. So obviously everybody is a son you know, in the Bible. So, uh, you know, you can't really rely on this, I'm afraid to say son of God, because everybody is a son of God. And obviously Jesus doesn't say he's God. So all you have is your own rationality, I'm afraid, Sam. A little rationality there, a little rationality there, but it doesn't prove at yeah, all. Three and a half yeah, minutes. Three, three and a half minutes, yeah, I'm yeah. on the case. Yeah. And uh, in fact, if we replace son of God with servant, I think you'll say exactly what we say, and it'll be much more precise. And uh, in fact, if you look at Luke 4, 41, he actually detested being labeled the son of God. So, you know, I have a couple, couple of things really in my first rebuttal. Jesus, as we said, never said he's God. And um, his disciples never said he's God. And in fact, uh, he admits that he's distinct. He's, he talks about God the Father. And he never says uh, right, uh, to worship me as well. And oddly enough, you know, I have a quote here. I, can, I wonder if you can guess who said this, Sam. Who would be convinced that he is God when he's dying on the cross. You know who said that, Sam? Can you remember? It was you <laughs> in a debate. You see, you admitted it yourself. The truth always prevails, you know, Sam. Sometimes you just expose yourself. And um, obviously, if you die, you can't be God. I mean, these things are so clear. Uh, and what was, uh, what was God doing, you know, when he was born? He came out of the womb of uh, Maryam, alayhi salam. Are you saying really that God was born from the womb? And uh, he was weak and needy. And what was he doing at that time? You know, he was God, was he, as a baby? Come on. Let's think about this. And uh, as I say, you know, Paul says that no one can see God. And yet we can see many people saw Jesus. Uh, the Bible said God uh, gave power 
and authority to Jesus. But I thought he was God. Why does he need to be given power? And, uh, you know, I can go on and on about this, uh, the misconceptions that you have about, uh, about Jesus um, and about your understanding about uh, what exactly the Son of God. I know I have one and a half minutes. Uh, I'm monitoring the time now. And, uh, you know, he can go on. Look at Mark. Jesus prays. He can't do miracles. He said he doesn't know the end of the world. He denies he's perfect. He despairs of hope. All of these things. How can you really be God? Think about it. Open your mind. Um, in Mark 5.30, Jesus doesn't know that a woman touched him. How does he not know? What is your criteria for being a God? You know, and I will just, uh, in the last minute, I will say to you that uh, the use of the Son of God is not a new phenomenon. You know, the Rastafarians say, Haile Selassie is God. You know, the Alawis say that uh, Imam Ali is God. Uh, there are many uh, uh, examples of this. In fact, the Son of God was a very useful metaphor and uh, was very common among the Jews, you know, at that time. So don't be surprised. Uh, you know, the only thing I can see that you have really, uh, Sam, is a little bit of rationality here and there. And, uh, you know, that's not enough to prove that he's the Son of God. So once again, Sam, I ask you uh, to embrace Islam, declare your Shahada. There's no one truly worthy of worship or obedience or following except for Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. And of course, Jesus is not the son of God. But as I said, he's a prophet of God. We revere him. He was born immaculately without a father, you know, to the Virgin Mary, the way Adam -Salam, was born without a mother and father. It doesn't make him God either. And uh, you know, I invite you to Islam and to, to join me. And maybe we can be on the same team one day, Sam, debating Islam versus Christianity. Thank you, Anjem. Appreciate that. We have a few seconds left, but we'll keep moving here. And now we have reset the clock. And Sam, we will start that 12-minute clock when you start talking. Okay. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I beg the Father, fill me with power from the Spirit to respond accurately without error and for the glory of Jesus with the hopes that even Enjump will repent of his falsehood and embrace Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Now, let me try to deal with the objections he just raised, and I'll try to take the, the most recent objection and work my way backwards. Notice he said that Jesus prayed to God. <clears throat> and again, no Christian denies that Jesus prayed to God because in that context, he's praying to God the Father. I'm a Trinitarian. I do not believe there's a single person who is God. I believe the one God is infinitely more complex than his creation, which even the Quran admits there's nothing comparable to God. So that means God's mode of existence will transcend the existence of his creatures. And lo and behold, that's what we find in the Bible. The one God is more than one person. He's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Because they're different persons who exist as one God, they communicate with one another. They fellowship with one another, and they love one another. So Jesus praying to the Father is something I would expect to find if he's a different person from the Father. And when we add the fact that this Son of God also became man, because all those objections that he ate, he drank, didn't know, it's because I don't deny that Jesus is truly human. I thought I made it clear that Jesus is a true human being and is a prophet and is a king and is a priest because he's truly human. But don't ignore those passages that show that he's more than human. He's also God, co-equal to the Father in relation to divine essence. But what's ironic about this objection? Here's what's ironic. His own Quran says that his own God prays. In fact, do you remember when he mentioned Muhammad's name? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu means the prayers of Allah Alehi, be upon him. So his own God prays. So if Jesus can't be God because he prayed, then Allah can't be God because he also prays. And that's found in the Quran. Chapter 33, verse 56 of the Quran. Chapter 33, verse 56. Lo, Allah and his angels pray for Muhammad. You salun comes from the verb salah. Pray for Muhammad. O you who believe, pray for him and salute him. Chapter 33, verse 43. He it is, Allah it is, who prays for you. Huwa alayhi yusalli. Yusalli from the verb salah. So if you have a problem with Jesus being God because he prays, time for you to give up on Allah because he prays. Now my question to you would be, since you don't believe Allah is tri-personal, who in the world is he praying to when he prays for Muhammad and he prays for believers and when he joins the angels and prays with them? Because don't forget, it says Allah and his angels together pray for your prophet. So it's time for you to abandon Islam. <clears throat> now, another ironic thing, and this is why it just blew my mind. He said, God has many sons, 
That metaphor, son of God, is used all throughout the scripture. Well, thank you for proving to me Muhammad is a false prophet. Why? Because according to your Quran, Muhammad did not accept the term father even in a metaphorical spiritual sense. How do I know this? Chapter 5, verse 18. Notice what he says. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. The Jews and Christians say, we are the sons of Allah and his loved ones. No Jew, no Christian at the time Muhammad believed they were the biological, physical offspring of Allah who sired them sexually. When they said they were the sons of Allah, they meant it spiritually or metaphorically. Did your prophet say like you, oh yeah, that's okay. You can be a son of God metaphorically because it's the same thing as saying servant of God. Let's see what your prophet said. So either you're going to agree with your prophet or you know more than your prophet. If you know more than your prophet, stop being a Muslim because here's his response. Say, why then doth he chastise you for your sins? Nay, you are not his sons. You are but mortals of his creating. So obviously, either you're going to agree with Muhammad or you disagree with him and agree that God does have sons metaphorically, which means you can't be a Muslim. Anjam, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And you accuse me of selectively citing the Quran when you're selectively citing the Bible to try to prove your position when it ends up backfiring against you. So my brother in humanity, time for you to give up on Islam, embrace Jesus as your only hope of salvation. I really care for you enough. I don't want you to go to hell, and this path is going to lead you to hell, but Jesus will save you from the wrath to come. This too was ironic. In fact, I'm very disappointed in the level of argumentation, and it's not to put you down, because I thought you would at least would have studied my materials to see the responses that I already prepared to these typical Muslim objections. You said, Jesus, nowhere says, I am God or worship me. Well, nowhere did Jesus say, I am the word of Allah. Nowhere did Jesus say, I'm a spirit from him. Nowhere did Jesus say, I'm the Messiah. And yet you believe Jesus is Allah's word, a spirit from him, the Messiah, even though he never said it. So that means if you're going to be consistent, again, you can't be a Muslim. Because the Quran says, Jesus is Allah's word. Jesus never said that. The Quran says, he's a spirit from him. In fact, you cited the verse, Surah the Nisa, 4171. You cited it. But those are not the words of Jesus. Those are the words of the author of the Quran which you erroneously think is Allah. So now if you're going to be consistent, since Jesus never said he's Messiah, Allah's word or spirit from him, then you need to deny these things and therefore side with me and reject the Quran and condemn Muhammad as a false prophet. But obviously you won't do that because to you, it doesn't matter what Jesus says. It only matters what the Quran says. So please, for the love of God, which you claim to love, and for the sake of truth, stop being consistent. Now this objection took the cake. You had the audacity to misquote F.F. Bruce and Greg Blomberg. They did not say that the Gospel of John is a forgery or fabrication. What they said in context is that John was inspired by the Holy Spirit to correctly interpret the sayings of Jesus. After all, they believed John was a disciple of Jesus. But beyond that, I quoted Ibn Ishaq to show you that even your earliest sources believe that John, the disciple of Jesus, wrote the gospel down. But even beyond that argument, let's assume for argument's sake, John is a fabrication. If John is a fabrication and he's written, this gospel is written in the first century, within the lifetime of the followers of the apostles, the tabi'in, the followers of the apostles, and you call into question its textual integrity, how much more should you reject what the Quran says about Jesus when it's 600 years removed from Jesus and his followers? If these scholars are going to question the Gospel of John because it's later and because it's supposedly more theologically embellished, can you for the life of me tell me with a straight face these same scholars would believe what the Quran says Jesus did? Are you telling me that the, these scholars would say, yes, Jesus spoke as an infant while still in the cradle like the Quran says? Are you seriously telling me that these, these scholars would also say that Jesus is the one running on saying, Allah's my Lord and your Lord worship him. I'll give you a million bucks tonight if you quote one of these scholars saying, oh yeah, John's gospel is not historical, it's a fabrication. Oh, but the words attributed to Jesus in the Quran, they're historical, although 600 years removed. Again, for the love of God and for the sake of truth, please stop being so blatantly inconsistent. If you actually believe this argument against John, they need to turn this argument against Muhammad and side with me in rejecting the Quran as fabrication, as a fraud, which it is when it comes to the life of Jesus and the prophets, and join me in worshiping Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then you said, 
Jesus is one of the righteous brought near to Allah. Again, I, I feel kind of ashamed and embarrassed for you that a Christian has to teach you what the Quran says. The Quran doesn't say that Jesus is simply one of the righteous. The Quran actually says that Jesus is actually dwelling with Allah wherever Allah is. Now, you being a Salafi, you believe that Allah is above the throne, above the seven heavens. Lo and behold, chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran. When Allah said, O Jesus, lo, I am gathering thee and causing thee to ascend unto me. Notice, he didn't say, I'm going to cause you to ascend to the second heaven, as your later traditions say. I'm going to cause you to ascend to me. <clears throat> and then in chapter 4, verse 158, but Allah took him, Jesus, unto himself. So if you believe in the Quran, you must believe that Jesus, and only Jesus, not even the angels, not even Jibreel, only Jesus is actually with Allah exactly where Allah is. That means according to your Quran, and again, just to correct you again, I, I stated clearly why I'm quoting the Quran. You believe in it. So I'm showing you what you're supposed to believe. And what you're supposed to believe is that my Bible is incorruptible. Stop attacking it because in attacking it, you deny the Quran. But if you agree with the Quran, the Bible's incorruptible. Then you have to deny the Quran, which contradicts the Bible. Islamic Dilemma 101, damn if you do, damn if you don't. Time for you to be, be a Christian and worship Jesus. But according to your Quran, getting back to the point, Jesus is now dwelling above the seven heavens, above the throne with Allah. That's the plain, explicit statement of your Quran. So you can try to spin it. You can try to misinterpret, misinterpret it. But remember, the Quran is supposedly in plain speech. In fact, plain Arabic. And the English is just as clear as the Arabic. I took Jesus to myself, so says Allah, whom you think is the God of the Bible. So no, he's not just one of the righteous. He's actually the most righteous, the most exalt exalted. So righteous, so pure, that he alone dwells alongside Allah, whereas everyone else is beneath Allah and Jesus. So again, embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior, because even your Quran says he's exalted above all creation, exalted even above Muhammad. The next point you said. What was it that you said here? What the Quran says about Jesus. You quoted 4159. All right, that's irrelevant to the topic. Whether you believe that in the end everyone's going to be a Muslim or not. <clears throat> Again, that's your prerogative. But here's the dilemma though. Here's the dilemma for you. You cited a hadith, and I wanted everyone to hear this. You said, Jesus will return, abolish the jizya, abolish the taxation upon non-Muslims, specifically Jews and Christians who live under Islamic rule, destroy all crosses, and kill all swine. Basically, what the hadith is saying is that Jesus will usher in Islam so that all Jews and Christians must become Muslims. Thank you for proving that the Quran will be abrogated by Jesus, proving that Jesus is a prophet who cancels out the sunnah of your prophet. And the only way that Jesus could abolish the jizya, a standing command in the Quran, and convert the entire world to Islam, is if he makes obsolete Chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran, which says that Jews and Christians must pay the jizya, and makes obsolete all those commands in the Quran, the direct Muslims, and how to treat and deal with non-Muslims. 40 so seconds. You, you basically said, when Jesus comes, all those passages about the treatment of non-Muslims will be abrogated. But I thought Muhammad is the last prophet and messenger. No prophet and messenger can come and abrogate his sunnah. But you quoted a hadith where Jesus will exactly do that abrogate the sunnah of your prophet and his book. Therefore, the Quran is wrong when it says Muhammad is the last prophet and messenger because Jesus, a prophet and messenger before him, comes after him to abrogate, right, <clears throat> to cancel out <clears throat> his very sunnah, his very book. Thank you for proving again why you shouldn't be a Muslim and you need to embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. All right. And Thank I bear witness that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The Thank Father. you, Sam. We're moving along. We've got eight minutes now. We're going to reset the clock. Anjem, you have an eight-minute rebuttal, and we will start the clock when you start talking, sir. Yes, uh, Sam. Uh, very interesting, actually. Uh, now you're talking about something which uh, we can agree about, that Jesus prayed to God, indeed. So obviously he cannot be God. He can't be praying to himself, can he? And then you try to qualify that by saying they're different. They're completely distinct. So are we talking about two gods now? We can't have it both ways. You were talking about having your cake and eating it. I think you're having your cake, eating it, and then having your cake again and eating it again, quite frankly. And then you said they communicate with each other. Think about it, Sam. Just take a step back. God's communicating with himself. I mean, if a person does that, 
that usually that's a sign of insanity, isn't it? We say one of the first signs of insanity is for someone talk to him, talking to himself. And here you say they are all God, but they're completely distinct. Come on, Sam. You know, I've got pictures of me and my son. Are we the same person? They were distinct, completely different. We cannot be the same person. We communicate with each other the way that you said. Really, you've destroyed your own argument, Sam. You know, how much uh, you may think that you're giving an argument, your own statements uh, really refute yourself. And I'm sure you repeat them and you're trying to justify them rationally. And this is the problem. It's not rational. One is not three. Three is not one. You know, if you think about it. Look, you know, we have three here. That's one. One and three. They're different. It's just a reality. This is rationality. And then you said uh, he was truly human. Completely human. So if he was completely human, how can he be completely God as well? It doesn't make sense. You cannot have the thesis and antithesis. You cannot have the opposites together. Man is weak, limited, needy. Allah is not weak. He's not limited. He's not needy. Therefore, it's a complete contradiction. Can you see that, Sam? Just think about it. When you see tonight, think to yourself, can three really be one and one three? How can that just be justified? Why is he speaking to himself? You know, how can it be God and man at the same time? It doesn't make sense. And one of the things you said here was uh, that the, we rely upon the Bible. So you rely upon the Quran. And uh, obviously you say that we should uh, therefore also take the Bible. There's a big difference, uh, Sam, because the Quran was written down contemporaneously. It was written down on parchment, on gazelle skin, on shoulder blades, on, you know, on animal skin. It was memorized in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa by him and his companions. You know, in, in, in one and a half or two billion Muslims around the world, there's only one Quran. Whether you're Shia, Sunni, Khawarij, or whatever you want to call yourself, there's only one Quran. Whereas you have many versions of the Bible. You have thousands of versions of the Bible. And you change it every day. You know that. You know, recently they had a, they had a vote in uh, Ireland yesterday where they said you can marry each other if you're gay. I'm sure, you know, your colleagues in Ireland, they will take out verses of the Bible. They will say, well, you know, we can just take out Leviticus. Why not? You can change it as you wish. Change it as you go along. You know, the, the, the church now accepts uh, women to be priests. You know, take away the, the, the verses to do with that. Homosexuality is fine. You can change it. Why? Because it was not written down. It was not uh, preserved. You know, I know that Jesus came before the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but that doesn't mean that the Bibles, uh, you know, the Old uh, Testament or the New Testament are authentic. And, you know, um, I think this would be a good time, really, to uh, dispel that myth. And really, for the Muslims and the non-Muslims out there, in case you didn't know, this is the reality of... Uh, of the of the of the gospels uh you know in the new testament did you know for example authentically narrated by abdullah ibn abbas radiallahu anhu about uh, injil matta or the the gospel according to matthew matthew was indeed one of the 12 students of isa alayhi salam and he accompanied jesus until allah elevated uh isa alayhi salam and he spread christianity from city to city until he reached abyssinia and there he was assassinated in 62 a.d but Imam Baqilani, 4th century Hijri, by the way, Alim, he said that Matthew did not write the gospel that you have today. What the people said at that time, they spoke Aramaic, and the oldest copy was written in the Greek language. You see, so it cannot be authentic. That's not what, uh, uh, you know, Matthew said. And if you look at Mark, Abdullah ibn Abbas said his name was, in fact, John, and his title was Mark. He was a Jew from uh, Canaanis. And um, he was not a disciple, but he was one of the first to believe in him. And he was among the 70 ministers. However, if we look, Imam Bakilani said that, um, that in fact, what happened is that, um, you know, that uh, this was something which was fabricated, in fact. And uh, he accompanied Saul and he used to be a Jew, as we know. And, uh, and obviously after that, he uh, invented many things. And really, you can see that what crept into this one is what Paul really dictated. And uh, he said, this was an evil man. He fabricated the things about the Trinity, seeing the light, transubstantiation, confession, original sin, etc. And that is, uh, that is the effect of Paul, sadly, on Mark as well. If we look at Injil Luke, Luke as well, uh, he was a strong student of and uh, follower of Paul, in fact. Not of Isa alayhi salam at all. And in fact, you can see again, it was fabricated and uh, and written really by him, and we already uh, we already dealt with the issue of John. I don't think uh, any serious uh, scholar 
whether Christianity or Islam indeed, is going to accept that uh, the, the Gospel of John was written, in fact, by him, uh, and it can be attributed to the Nabi Isa uh, alayhi uh, salam. But you know, there's one thing I'd like to share with you. I know your friend Jay doesn't like to talk about it, but it's the Gospel of Barnabas. <laughs> You know, you like, you like the Gospel of Barnabas. You know, the oh, Gospel of Barnabas minutes. was accepted. Okay. I know, I, there's two ministers enough for me to talk about Barnabas. Okay. Okay. It was accepted as a canonical gospel in the churches of Alexandria until 325 CE. Arrhenius uh, wrote in support of pure monotheism and opposed Paul for injecting in Christianity doctrines of pagan Roman religion and Platonic philosophy. And he's quoted extensively from the Gospel of Barnabas in support of his views. And we see in the 4th century, the Emperor Zeno, who was CE 478, as well he talks about the remains of Barnabas being discovered and they were found in his breast a copy of the Gospel of Barnabas written in his own hand. And this is in Asia Sanctorum Bolland, Juni Tom 2nd, uh, pages 422 to 450. And we can see Toland as well in his miscellaneous works, published posthumously in 1747, volume 1, page 380, mentions the Gospel of Barnabas. You know, the reason why we mention the Gospel of Barnabas is because it was rejected by the Council of Nicaea. There were 500 scholars who uh, rejected 120 Gospels and burned them all, also rejected Barnabas. But in fact, if you look in the Gospel of Barnabas, Jesus is the servant of God, lo and behold. And uh, he said that Muhammad uh, will come after me. And he said, Jesus said to me, in fact, that uh, don't worry about me, they can't harm me, God will elevate me. And he spoke about the life, life of Jesus exactly the same as we do, you see, uh, uh, Sam. So in my last 30 seconds, I will say to you once again, once again, you see from your own words, you refuted your argument that Jesus prayed and he separated, he believed in three gods and not one. And I've proven as well, the gospels are not authentic. And of course, you know, Islam is the truth, you know, and therefore, once again, Sam, and the people of this channel watching embrace Islam before death embraces all of us. Thank you, Anjam. And we have uh, eight minutes remaining before we go to break. So we'll reset the clock and Sam will start that eight minute clock as soon as you start talking. <clears throat> okay. Praise be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. May anoint me to speak truth for the glory of Christ. And so that Anjam can convicted and get saved. <clears throat> Um, again, he reiterated the fact that Jesus prayed to God the Father, and because that proves that they're distinct, somehow this means that they're two gods. And this argument assumes that God's existence is identical to the way creatures exist. It is true that among creatures, <clears throat> when you find one being, typically that's also a single person. But both the Bible and the Quran agree, Allah, whom he believes is the God of the Bible, so I'll use the term Allah, is unlike anything in creation. In order for his argument to work, that God cannot be a single God if he's more than one person, that means God's mode of existence must be identical to his creatures. If it is, that means now he's made creatures identical to God, thereby committing shirk, because he's now likening God's existence to the existence of his creation, making them partners in the way they exist. Therefore, you have now committed shirk. My brother in humanity, you now stand condemned by the Quran as a mushrik, off the hell you go. You need to repent. God is unlike anything in creation. Therefore, his existence won't be comparable to anything in creation. To say that God is one in one way and more than one in another way is not a contradiction because you believe this. For example, you said one is not three, three is not one. Well, one is not 99 and 99 is not one. You believe Allah is one, but he has 99 names and attributes. Therefore, I'm going to insist you need to become a mutazili because the mutazilites said, that Allah cannot have a plurality of attributes if he is a singular being. So they're more consistent than you. So the fact that you believe that Allah is one and 99 means that again, you have 99 gods. And you'd say, nonsense. I'm saying Allah is one in one way, but he's more than one in another way. And there's no contradiction. Exactly. God can be one in one sense, one being, but more than one in another sense. A plurality of persons and attributes no contradiction. The contradiction only exists in your mind because you're likening your God to creation. Now maybe your God is like creation. My God isn't. He's infinitely greater than creation. But here's what's ironic. If Jesus praying to the Father proves he's a separate God from the Father, then your Quran is a separate God from Allah. Because as a Salafi, as someone who's part of the Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah, you believe the Quran is Kalam Allah, the speech of Allah. And it's one of his sifat, his attributes. And it's uncreated. 
Well, if the Quran is uncreated, then it has to be Allah. But you'll say, no, no, it's not Allah. It's the speech of Allah. Well, if it's not Allah, then you have something other than Allah that's eternal. That's two eternals. You have two gods. Allah and the Quran, start worshipping your Quran. But it's going to get even worse. Here's a hadith from Mishkat al-Masabi. Mishkat al-Masabi. Here's a hadith where your Quran prays to Allah. Let me read it to you. Khalid bin Madan said, recite the rescuer, which is Alif Lam Mim, the sending down. For I have heard that a man who had committed many sins used to recite it and nothing else. It spread its wings over him. The Quran spread its wings over him and said, my Lord, forgive him, for he often used to recite me. So the Quran has a Lord over it, and the Quran is praying to Allah, and the Quran intercedes with Allah. So that's now two conscious entities, Allah the Quran, and if the Quran is speaking to Allah, definitely it cannot be Allah. You have two gods, now you're a mushrik, you stand condemned. Time for you to abandon Islam and worship Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, you butchered church history. You said in the Council of Nicaea, they rejected the Gospel of Barnabas and other Gospels. Again, I have to say, in sincere love for you, because I love you for the sake of Jesus, and I really want to see you get saved, but the path you're headed is a path to destruction. May Jesus rescue you, rescue you from that path, because the Quran cannot rescue you. The Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with the canonization of the books of the New Testament. I know Muslims like to repeat this lie, but it is a lie. Just pick up any book on church history, you will see that council had nothing to do with the canonization of the books of the New Testament. That's one. Number two, you confused the Gospel of Barnabas, which is a 16th century medieval forgery, with the Epistle of Barnabas. You confused two different documents. Yes, the Epistle of Barnabas is believed to be something written either in the latter part of the first century or the start of the second century. And that epistle is thoroughly orthodox in its view of Jesus because it identifies Jesus as the Lord, the Son of God, who is with God the Father, and whom God the Father uttered the words of Genesis 1.26. In the epistle of Barnabas, the author has God the Father saying to Jesus, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, thereby affirming that this author believed Jesus was there with the Father at creation and was used by the Father to create all things. Now, if you're right that the Gospel of Barnum is true, you again prove that Muhammad is a false prophet. Man, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. The Quran goes out of its way to say that Jesus is the Messiah. But in this forgery that you're citing, Jesus says, no, I'm not the Messiah. The one who comes after me, whose name is Muhammad, he's the Messiah. So if the Gospel of Barnabas is right, that means the Quran is wrong because the Quran says Jesus is the Messiah. But in this gospel, Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm not the Messiah. Muhammad is. So I'm going to challenge you. Quote a verse in the Quran where Jesus says, I'm not Messiah. And where it says, Muhammad is the Messiah. Please, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So for the love of God that you claim to love and for the sake of truth, abandon these weak, pathetic arguments and see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who's the image of God and your only hope of salvation. What else did you say here? Oh, you quoted Irenaeus to say he's a Unitarian? <laughs> and I don't mean to laugh to belittle you. Believe me, I don't mean this. And what I say this with all sincerity. I love you for the sake of Jesus, who created you for his glory, who owns you, and I hope you recognize that before it's too late for you. Irenaeus was no Unitarian. He's a Trinitarian. Let me cite Irenaeus for you from his own works, which you can read online for free. Please, stop citing Muslim internet articles that only end up embarrassing you when you try to present these lies and fabrications. Let me show you what he said. Irenaeus, writing in 180 AD, against heresies, book 2, chapter 30, section 9. Notice what he says about the Son. But the Son, eternally coexisting, with the Father, from of old, yea, from the beginning, always reveals the Father to angels, archangels, powers, and virtues. 57 Notice, seconds. The Son is eternal, the Father is God, God is the Father, and the Son reveals the Father to his creation. Therefore, since you cited Irenaeus, Irenaeus condemns Muhammad as a false prophet. Muhammad said God is not the Father, Jesus is not the eternal Son, all of which Irenaeus affirmed. Another quote, against heresies, Book 1, chapter 10, section 1. This is what he writes. Christ Jesus is our Lord and God and Savior 
and king. He's our Lord. Quran denies that. Actually, it probably affirms that, but we can debate. What does the Quran actually te teach about Jesus? And God, he's our God, and Savior and king. Since you cited Irenaeus as a Unitarian, he stands as a witness against you and against Muhammad. Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Bow the knee to him. It's too late for Muhammad, but there's hope for you. And he's Lord over Muhammad. Praise his holy name. Amen. Right on time. And we're going to take the opportunity now. Take a deep breath here. And we're going to go on a quick break. So stay with us. We've got more to come. And we will be taking your calls at 248-416-1300. Come on back with us after this brief break. Hello everyone, if you're watching the news and you look around at the things that are going on in the world, you may notice that we are in perilous times, and we are. But there's a positive side that we should not miss. This is also a time of opportunity. Uh, people are killing and raping and beheading because they have believed a lie. And you combat the lie with the truth. And Christians have an opportunity right now that we have not had for 14 centuries of Islam. For 14 centuries, if you wanted to share the gospel with Muslims and refute Islam, you had a very good chance of dying. But right now, in our time, we have an opportunity to share the gospel with Muslims because many Muslims are coming to the West for school or, or through immigration. And now we can share the gospel with them in complete safety. But at the same time, we can reach Muslims even in Muslim countries. We can reach Muslims around the world from this studio. But we can only do that with your help. I encourage you to support the Trinity Channel so that as we share the truth, it will go out to people around the world and will convince Muslims that Jesus Christ is Lord through the power of the gospel. Do you have a Samsung Smart TV? Would you like to watch the Trinity Channel on your Samsung Smart TV device? We'd like to share with you an easy way to set up the Trinity Channel and view it on any Samsung Smart TV. If you set the home page on your browser to this address shown on the screen, the Trinity Channel will broadcast live upon entering the browser. It takes about five seconds to load the website once entering the browser. If you have any questions about setting up the Trinity Channel on your Samsung Smart TV device, please give ABN a call at 248-416-1300 and we'll be happy to help you. And we are back and we are uh, into the segment now that we're going to be asking questions. Each uh, debater, uh, Anjum first and then Sam, will have 10 minutes each to ask questions of the other debater. So Anjum, you will go first. You have 10 minutes that you can ask questions, not respond to Sam's answers, but you can ask those questions and we'll encapsulate that in 10 minutes. And then Sam will uh, in turn ask you questions and you respond accordingly. So we're gonna go ahead and reset that clock for 10 minutes. And Anjum, you uh, can start any time. So uh, shall I use the 10 minutes to put down my questions, or are we going back and forth? We, you, you will ask the question, and Sam will respond, and then you can ask another question, and so we'll, we'll be... So that will be reversed. Right. <laughs> so yeah. your first question. Yeah, I, I, well, I mean, the first question uh, that I would like to ask Sam is um, if uh, he believes that Jesus is completely distinct from God. He said that he's completely distinct and he, uh, he, they're two different entities. Then surely that is two gods. How can, uh, how can that be that two are completely distinct and different and yet they're the same? It's impossible. There's no way. And can you point to anything else in this life? I mean, you know, in our own rational logic, there's no one, a child would never accept that two things are completely distinct, they're completely separate, and yet they can be one and the same. Nobody will accept that. And the fact that he prayed to God, do you believe, Sam, you know, and this is part of my first question, 
that God came from the womb of a mother. You really believe that God existed in the womb of a mother and came out uh, of uh, of the Virgin Mary? Okay, Do you really Allah believe Allah that? Allah 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 you want to answer that question? Yeah, very easy. Uh, again, you're committing shirk. Notice what you said. There's nothing that I can point to to life that's comparable to God existing as a plurality of persons. For the life of me, I don't understand why a Muslim would ask me this question. According to chapter 42, verse 11 of your Quran, I'm even telling you what your Quran says. 42, 11, in chapter 112, verse 4, it says, there's nothing like unto him, there's nothing comparable to him. Of course, I can't point to something in creation that's identical to the way God exists, because if I could, then that means both the Bible and the Quran are wrong. There are things that are comparable to him. So again, you want to have your cake and eat it too. Either you believe God is infinitely greater than creation and exists in a manner different from the way his finite creatures exist, or you're going to liken God to the creation, and therefore you're going to associate creation with God. You're now a mushrik, and you stand condemned to hell. Going back to, your, uh, to the question about Jesus being completely distinct from God. If you notice what I said, I said the Father, because you're assuming that God is a single person. So if God is a single person and Jesus is distinct from him, then there would be two gods. But I don't believe that. I believe the Father is God and that Jesus is his eternal Son, his Word, and that also the Holy Spirit belongs to the Father so that they're not se three separate beings, but one eternal being, the Father, his eternal Word, his Son, his Beloved, and his eternal Spirit. I even gave you something similar in Islam. I don't believe in Islam. I don't believe what you believe, but you believe it. You believe the same thing about the Quran. The difference between you and me is, I believe Allah's kalam, kalam Allah, which the Quran calls Jesus, by the way, kalimat Allah, became flesh. You believe it became a book. And yet at the same time, you would not say the Quran is Allah, nor would you say the Quran is created, because if you said the Quran is created, you now stand outside the fold of Islam, you now commit kufr, and you stand condemned, because I know what you believe. You're a Salafi and you belong to Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah. According to what you believe, Quran is Kalam Allah. It's uncreated. So now maybe you need to explain to me, and I'm going to ask you when it's my time to ask questions, how the Quran can be uncreated, eternal, and yet not be the same as Allah. You have two gods, and I even quoted a narration. And there's not just one. I have many. I wrote an article on this. That the Quran actually speaks to your God. So if you have a problem with Jesus praying to the Father, even though I keep saying he's not the Father, how much more should you have a problem with the book praying to your God? But it seems that that doesn't bother you because your response to me will be, Allahu Alam, this is Islam. Muhammad said it, I accept it, even though it doesn't make sense, Allahu Alam. Stop being inconsistent and please be consistent. And to answer your question, yes, the eternal son who's fully God became a flesh and blood human being and chose to be born from his blessed mother and received a human nature from her and came out of her blessed womb by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's what God did because that's how much he loves his creation. I know your God doesn't love creation that much, but don't get upset with us when we say that God loved us so much that he would do that for us to save us from the wrath to come. Okay, we still have a little over five minutes. You can go ahead and ask another question. Ask. Yeah. Anjum? Can I carry on? Yes, more ask. questions. You got yeah, so, um, yeah. You know, uh, Sam, it's not a difficult one to deal with, actually. You refer to the ayah in the Qur'an, Allah said, Laysa shay. There's nothing like Allah. And obviously we believe that the Qur'an is kalam Allah haqiqi. Uh, it is recitable, but it is audible. Bila kayf, without to say how. This is something that Allah revealed to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We don't say that it's part, you know, uh, that Allah become distinct. Rather, Allah spoke. It was his kalam. And uh, Jibreel alayhi salam, he repeated it to the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we recite it. We recite the word of Allah. But we never said that. Uh, okay. Anjum, you're too, time to ask a question. You're, Anjum, you're, you're making a response. You've got to ask finishing. questions. I'm, this is my uh, 10 minutes. Uh, no, this is the questions. time to ask questions. Ask a question. Uh, ask me questions. I'm coming yes. to answer the question. I'm just, I'm just answering, uh, answering it. Got you can answer when it's your turn. Not yeah. now. Let me put them all together for you, Sam. Um, first of all, you know, the, you can list them if you want. Jesus, uh, obviously, is not all-knowing. As we know, God is all-knowing. So, you know, in Mark 24, 32 to 36, he said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, and uh, not even the angels in the heaven, but only my Father. So Jesus didn't know. He said he was God as well, so he doesn't know. Question number one, how comes he doesn't know everything if he's God? 
And the second part, I'll put them all together. Jesus never said he's God. We know this one already. You, uh, you, you couldn't answer that one. You just uh, used some rationality. But let's see the second question I have. Uh, you uh, even uh, uh, the Old Testament says not to trust the Son of Man. So uh, according to your Old Testament, you shouldn't trust Jesus. This is what you say, Matt 8, uh, number 20. He said, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And uh, Matt 9, 6, he may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Wow. Arise, what is your question? Okay. Well, you you asked me four have, questions. Yeah. Can I answer? Sorry, well, well, I was going to just put them all together because it will help, okay. really. Another, I put them, wind down, wind them down. And Jesus was, if I'd given power and authority by God, so if he was all powerful, that doesn't make sense. You can see this in um, John 17, 6 to 8, that all things whatsoever had been given to me, and I have been given unto them the words thou, uh, which thou yeah, gave three me. Three minutes. A bit, uh, I can't a bit three English, minutes, but nevertheless, he was given authority. And I, have, I have a lot of questions like this, but I don't think you really I got three minutes to answer. answer. Do you want an answer? Do you want to make start, speeches? Sam. You can start. Go on. Okay. Well, you, you just bombarded me with six questions, which I'll be more than happy to answer. So I'm going to have to take my time to answer because you left me with three minutes. Now, what's ironic, Sorry. here's what's blowing my mind again, away. You quoted Matthew 9, 6, and you said, Jesus said, for the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. According to your Quran, chapter 3, verse 135, Allah alone forgives sins, so thank you for quoting a passage where Jesus again claimed to be God. You're not helping your case by citing these passages. You cited Matthew 9, 6, and you said, Jesus said, for the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Read your Quran, Anjam, chapter 3, verse 135. It says, who can forgive sins but Allah alone? And you just cited Jesus claiming to forgive sins, something only God can do. Thank you for helping me prove that Jesus is God in the flesh. And then you referred to a passage about the Son of Man. Go read that passage in context. The reference to Son of Man means fallible, imperfect human beings. And yes, all of us sons of men are infallible. I'm sorry, fallible, imperfect. We're not trustworthy. But conveniently, you didn't quote Daniel 7, 13 and 14 and mention that particular Son of Man. Here's Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and there was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Read your Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 210. Allah comes with the clouds and his angels. This son of man comes with the clouds, which even the Quran says it's something that only Allah does. He came to the Ancient of Days. That's two, son of man, Ancient of Days. And this is the prophet Daniel, two, right? And was presented before him. Watch this. There was given to him dominion. This son of man was given dominion, glory, a kingdom that all peoples, nations, not some, all peoples, that includes Muslim peoples, that includes you, all languages, all nations, that includes you, the Muslim ummah, should worship him. Worship who? This son of man who comes with the clouds. His dominion, the son of man, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And if you go to Mark 14, 61, 62, when the high priest says to Jesus, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? He says, I am, and you shall see the son of man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus claims to be this son of man, not an ordinary son of man who's a sinner like you and I, but this glorious son of man who's distinct from the ancient of days, meaning the father, and yet with the father rules forever, and it's to be worshipped by all creation. That means Jesus is claiming the very ibadah of God. 15 he's saying, seconds. You have to worship me, the wor worship the Father. And he's also claiming the rububia of God, that he is sovereign over creation. So now the problem is in your hands. If Jesus is a creature, then God wouldn't give a creature Sam, his glory. Time but he up. does, because he's no creature. Okay, Sam, now you, we have 10 minutes to reset the clock or 10 minutes for the next segment here. And you now, Sam, you can ask the questions. And we'll start right now. Now, again, Anjum, I respect you because you have demonstrated to me that you're quite honest. And I'm not just saying this. I've actually said, people, you're one of the most honest Muslims that I've met because you, you say it like it is, and I really respect you for that. And like I said, I have love for you for the sake of Jesus. But here's my question to you. And I know you're going to answer honestly. You're not going to tap dance. You're not going to do what other Muslims do because I know that you're different. <clears throat> Can you explain to me who does your God pray to when he prays for Muhammad and believers? Because in chapter 33, verse 43 of the Quran, it says this. He it is who prays for you or upon you 
and so do his angels. And you know the Arabic verb very well. It's yusalli, from salla. It's not baraka, so don't tell me it's blessing. Which verse? Uh, let me make my question. Uh, chapter 33, I'm sorry. Chapter 33, verse 43 of the Quran. And you know Arabic, so you're not going to tell me, oh, it means baraka. No, blessing is baraka. And it doesn't mean rahma, that's mercy. It's yusalli, from the verb salla. He it is who prays for you believers, and so do his angels, that he may bring you forth from darkness unto light. The other one, which is relevant to what you said earlier, chapter 33, verse 56 of the Quran. Chapter 33, verse 56. Lo, Allah and his angels. And you know the Arabic conjunction, wa. It says, inna Allah wa malaikatu, right? Wa, angels. That's a conjunction of partnership. Because I've read the book by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, Kitab al tawheed And he cites narrations that says, this conjunction wa cannot be used for Allah and someone else because that means you're making this other group partners with Allah. Yet here, your Quran says Allah wa and the angels together perform salah. Both of them are praying for Muhammad. So can you please tell me, who does your God pray to when he prays for Muhammad? Yes, um, that's very convenient of you, actually, you know, Sam, to uh, misquote. Uh, basically, Allah mentions in the Quran here, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, this is chapter 33, 43. Uh, alaykum wa uh, he said here, it is he who confers blessing. You see, the problem that you have, Sam, is the word uh, uh, Yusalli doesn't just mean prayer. It means blessing. It has many meanings in the Arabic language. And this is the problem that you have. The Arabic language is a language has many meanings. The word Ayn in Arabic has over 60 meanings. The word Hadith has many, many meanings. So, you know, it's very convenient for you to, to look at it like that. And I'm not surprised because you're not a Muslim that you think that they're praying. And this is not the case. And I think your friend, Dad Doc, I can't remember his name, said the same thing. And uh, as well, the Ayah, chapter 33, 56 is the same. Here, Allah said here, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Inna Allaha wal malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. He said, indeed, Allah confers blessing. This is blessing. You see, it doesn't mean that he's praying. Uh, the word salah, in fact, means many meanings. And if you look at the Arabic language, if you look, for example, at Imam Fairuz Abadi, it is Qamus al muhit You see that this word, uh, uh, salah, is something that... Um, is uh, mujman, it is uh, abstract, it needs tafsir, it needs to be explained. And the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained to say, pray the way that you see me pray, do the ibadat, the ritual act. So the prayer now has a specific meaning in Arabic language. It's not like this used generally, it means the five prayers, you know, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha, uh, all of the movements, the Ruku, Salah, etc., uh, Sujood. So this is uh, the meaning of, uh, of uh, Aqim was Salah, for example, establish the prayer. Here is with another meaning, and that is that Allah is confirming blessing. Mean, you know, as we say, may Allah bless you. You know, may he confirm, uh, confer His own, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, virtue, uh, if you like, uh, goodness upon you. This is what it means. It doesn't mean that Allah is praying. No uh, uh, tafsir will say anything like that, Sam. Okay. Uh, actually, the tafsir does say. Actually, the point I made. You're an error again. So let me prove it to you. Here, this is tafsir Ibn Kathir on chapter 33, verse 56. This is what you say in your daily prayers. Now, tell me if you say this. I'm giving you the English translation. It says, say, O Allah, send your salah upon Muhammad and upon the family of Muhammad as you sent your salah upon the family of Ibrahim. Verily, you are the most praiseworthy, most glorious. Now, watch this. O Allah, send your blessings upon Muhammad and upon the family of Muhammad as you sent your blessings upon the family of Ibrahim. In this very prayer, which you're commanded to recite, both the verb salah and barakah are used, meaning salah does not have the same meaning as barakah. So why did you just say to the audience that the word salah does mean barakah when I thought I was clear? It said Allah and the angels are performing salah. You wouldn't dare say angels bless Muhammad. You would say angels invoke a blessing for Muhammad. Since the verb is describing the action of Allah and the angels, how could you dare change the definition and how do you explain this prayer where it mentions Allah both sending salah and barakah? Prayer and blessing showing they don't have the same meaning. So now can you come up with a better explanation? Because that explanation 
just got squashed by your own resources. So again, who does your God pray to when he does Salah for Muhammad and his, follow, uh, and his followers? Because here I just showed you, Salah does not mean Barakah. Salah and Barakah are distinguished in the prayer, and it says Allah is doing Salah with the angels. So now I'm going to expect a better answer from you because I know you're honest. So who does your God pray to when he prays for Muhammad? You know, uh, Sam, uh, the Arabic language is something uh, really is very unique and it's a beautiful language. And uh, the word uh, uh, Salah here means uh, to uh, give blessings. And the word Barakah is a thing which to facilitate, to ease uh, and goodness and doubt by Allah. You know, so they have different meaning. They have definitely have different meaning. And uh, I know that you try to use this one and your friend as well to say that Allah prays to the Prophet. And you know that's not true, Sam. And the thing is, you're just really, uh, you're just really undermining yourself because any Muslim who's looking at this debate, he will just say, "Well, you know, Sam's lost it, really." You know, because when we pray, we say, "May blessings and ease and facilitation, you know, be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Ibrahim alayhi salam." There's no Muslim, you know, who really believes that he's saying that Allah is praying to those people. So come on, I think you need to give okay. this one up. Let's ask okay. a different question. All right, let me ask. And by the way, I don't care about losing the debate. I want to win your heart for Jesus, Amen. your only hope of salvation. So you That's can win good, the debate Sam. as so, long as you get saved. Now, other question. Prevent. My time is up. Hold on. I only got, let me ask you a question. In your tashahud, five times a day, do you not say, and this is a yes or no, because I have a follow-up question. So please, my time is running out. Let me at least get this question in. Do you not say, As-salamu alayka, ahiyu nabi. Peace be upon you, O Prophet, in your daily, daily tashahud. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, we said. Okay, good. Now, since you said, you say in your prayer, Assalamu alaikum, or I'm sorry, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, O Prophet. How is it you're talking directly to a man who's been dead for 14 centuries? <laughs> you're in the UK, Muhammad is dead and buried in Medina. Why are you speaking to a dead man when the Bible condemns contacting the dead? And why are you addressing him in a prayer directed to Allah? Why are you now making part of the prayer and an address to Muhammad directly when he's dead? Why are you talking to a dead man? You know, the difference um, between um, the way that you supplicate and the way that we supplicate, the way that you pray and we pray, is that you make your prayers up as you go along. You know, you think anything is acceptable. You don't have to pray at certain times. And uh, this is the nature of Christianity. There's no set times, no set prayers. And therefore, I know that you ridicule us when we pray. But the Prophet said, pray the way you, you see me pray. So our Prophet prayed like this. You know, we have rules in Islam called ahkam tawqifiyah. You don't go beyond the text. If this is the way the Prophet prayed, we pray. The prayer is a ritual act. And therefore, we do this ritual act. We pray exactly the way the Prophet prayed. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And uh, that doesn't mean we're communicating with him. This is our ritual act towards Allah. Allah wants us to pray in this way. And, uh, you know, we pray in this way. It doesn't mean that we communicate with a dead person. Although, you know, if Allah wishes, he will send uh, our salam and he will send uh, the blessings upon uh, all of the prophets. And we know the prophets are alive in their own graves, you know, and how uh, Allah will uh, send our salutation upon him. We don't know how because uh, the barazak or the life after this life you know, between this life and the Day of Judgment is beyond our rationality. So we can't rationalize this psalm either. But we pray exactly the way the Prophet prayed. It doesn't mean that we're talking to him. Okay. Well, let me make a final point. So you can't rationalize it, but then you condemn me when I can't rationalize something that I believe because of the revelation of the Bible. Are you not being inconsistent? And did you, do, you know, not Sam, just refute yourself? You know, the psalm difference is you need to embrace Islam, sir. Okay. <laughs> Islam is All right. Truth. Okay, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think we'll, uh, we'll move forward here. We do have callers, and here's what I'm going to tell the callers right now. We're going to be real strict with you, so pay attention. One question, 30 seconds at the top, and then we're going to move along. We've got people waiting, so we'll take this first call. Tell us your question, and tell, it who, tell us who it's directed to, and Christian. And by the way, can, before they say, yes. how many minutes do you want the person to respond, and then the response, counter response? Two well, minutes let's say, one? I would say a minute. Okay. All right, so we'll Christian, go. go. Thank you very much. I hope uh, Mr. Shawadri is listening to me. First, you don't speak Arabic, and yet you are teaching us Arabic. However, if you go to the Quran, Mr. Shawadri, you will see that the verse it says, "In Allah wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi," which means Allah and the angels both are praying on the Prophet. So, if you say 
that Allah and the angels send in a blessing and the, uh, the prophet, this is mean the plus blessing comes from angels and from Allah, which means that will make angels are the source of a blessing, which is false and this is against the teaching of Islam. Because the only one who can teach, who can give a blessing is God himself. Therefore, it's the same action coming from both Allah and the angels, and it is mean pray. However, all the Quran using the word uh, Yusalli as prayer and always a prayer. Okay. However, this is not my question. My question is, in the, in the Hadith, your God, your Prophet said, Allah is not one eyed, but the false Messiah is, he have a problem with the, with, with, with the right eye, which means the only difference between the false Messiah and the true Messiah is the eye, but yet your prophet he compare between the face of Allah and the eyes, of, uh, the eyes of Allah and the eyes of false Messiah, which mean your God Allah is an individual, he is a man, he is a perfect man, and the only difference between him and the false Messiah is the eye which is having a problem, which means your God resembles exactly the look of Jesus, which explain why in Sahih al-Bukhari, your prophet said Allah will come to you in a shape different from the shape which you saw first time. Which Christian, means Allah, he a a Christian, shape. And Christian, let him answer. Yeah, quick. Excellent. Yes, uh, I think, Christian, you know, you expose your own uh, lack of understanding of Arabic. Alhamdulillah, I have enough understanding to be able to understand that when the, when the Malaika, they send their own uh, blessings, it is in the form of dua, asking Allah, obviously, to uh, to bless them. This is what we say, you know, we uh, may Allah bless you. This is our, our own, if you like, uh, supplication. But obviously, Allah is the only one who can uh, fulfill that request from us. We supplicate to him. He is the one who answers. So there's a very simple answer to that. And as, uh, as for your issue of the Dajjal, which you're talking about the Antichrist, yes, it's true. One of the signs of uh, the Dajjal is that he would be one-eyed. And uh, this is what the Prophet said. He said, every messenger of Allah told us about the Dajjal, but I will tell you something different, that he's one-eyed. That doesn't mean, you know, uh, that, uh, that Allah is exactly the same. And, uh, or rather, the, uh, I don't know what you're trying to say, that the, the, the actual uh, Isa alayhi salam, the only difference is that he has two eyes, or God is, uh, you know, at this point, it doesn't really make sense, really. But uh, Allah, if Allah, if Allah says that he is uh, Basir, you know, or if he is uh, the one who uh, is, uh, is able to see, obviously, he's aware of everything. He can see the things that no one can see, be like, hey, there's a world of difference between him and us, because we say, Laysa kamithli he shed, there's nothing like Allah, okay. so... You can make that distinction. Yeah. Let's take the next okay, well, caller. Let me get a minute of response. You want to respond? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, real quickly, I just want to say for the record that Amjam is a Salafi. So let me explain a little bit what he believes. He actually believes Allah literally has a face, has shins, has hands and eyes. In fact, he believes Allah has two right hands. He doesn't have a left one. Although it's unlike anything in creation. So I want the audience to understand what he believes. Allah literally has a face, eyes, two right hands, not a right and left one and shins, and he believes that on the day of judgment, he will recognize Allah because Allah is going to uncover his shin, and that's how he's going to know this is his Lord who is to be worshipped. Even though it's unlike anything in creation. And he talks about the Christian position being irrational. <clears throat> okay. Good point, gentlemen. Let's continue to watch the clock. Anthony, two things. Who's your question to? What is your question? Go. Hi, my question is for Anjum. Anjum, <laughs> earlier in the debate, you said that someone talking to himself is a sign of insanity. Now, Brother Sam has already explained that God is three persons, so when the Son speaks to the Father in the Godhead, it's not one person speaking to himself, but one person in the Trinity speaking to another person of the Trinity. However, as you admitted, the Quran is Allah's eternal speech. If so, since there was no one else there besides Allah for him to be speaking his eternal word to other than himself, do you admit that by your own reasoning, Allah is insane? If not, why not? <laughs> you know, uh, your logic is uh, not very good. Really. You know, because Allah spoke to uh, uh, the angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, and the malaika heard. And then Jibreel, alayhi salam, spoke to the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam. So Allah was not speaking to himself. The Quran is kalamullah, uh, ala munaz, you know, ala abdihi Muhammad. Bilafsul Arabi, it is uh, was revealed, you know, uh, to the angel Jibreel alayhi salam, then upon the Messenger Muhammad via the angel Jibreel upon the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So you know he's not speaking to himself, it's all for us. It is Hudan al it is it is guidance for mankind. So 
it's a very simple answer to that, really. I don't think we need to get too complicated uh, with our answer. Okay, let's, uh, real quick, quick response. I just want to yes. say, uh, both Christian Prince and Anthony Rogers are outstanding uh, Christian apologists. Christian Prince is outstanding against Islam. Anthony Rogers, outstanding against Islam and defending Christianity. So I love these two brothers. But real quickly, <clears throat> I guess he's not understanding the problem with this position concerning the Quran. He believes the Quran is Kalam Allah, the speech of Allah. Therefore, it's one of its attributes. But it's not Allah. It's distinct from Allah and even speaks to Allah. Let me, let me read another narration. This comes from Jami al-Tirmidhi. By Haqqi transmitted it in Shuab al-Iman. Let's read what it says. Narrated by Abdullah ibn Amr. Allah's Messenger said, Fasting and the Quran intercede for a man. Fasting says, Oh my Lord. And by the way, this is not simply metaphorical. The Quran and the Son of Muhammad show that he actually believed inanimate things were actually animate and conscious. Like trees could speak and stones could speak. This is all in Hadith. In fact, one Hadith has food glorifying Muhammad. So when Muhammad is about to eat the food, they'll say, SubhanAllah, praise Allah, the messenger is about to eat me. Right? And again, Muhammad believed this. So he believed fasting was a conscious agent. Fasting in the Quran intercede for a man. Fasting says, Oh my Lord, I have kept him away from his food and his passion, passion by day. So accept my intercession for him. Now watch. The Quran says, I have kept him away from sleep by night. So accept my intercession for him. The Quran is speaking to Allah. Therefore, it has to be something separate from Allah and conscious. That's now two distinct beings. Therefore, according to his logic, he has two separate gods. Allahu alam. Okay, good. Okay, can we're going to... Can, can I come back on that? Yes, yeah, quickly. Go, yeah, go. Quickly. You know, uh, you know the, the reality of the Day of Judgment, Sam, is very different. And what we know is that uh, if Allah wishes, you know, he can make anything speak. Your actions on that day, your recitation of the Quran, even your own body or limbs... They will testify for you. So this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about Allah testifying, you know, against himself. We're talking about your own actions. At that time will become, uh, you know, something that can be weighed. And uh, you're on the mizan. So, you know, this is something beyond our re uh, reality and rationality, Sam. So I don't think you need to make an analogy between this life and the, and the, and the death judgment. If Allah wants, he can make the tree speak or even the stone. That doesn't mean that they're like Allah or that, you know, that justifies the Trinity or that Allah, you know, has a son. I don't think you want to conflate the two. Okay, quickly, okay. I won't take one minute. Okay. Did you notice again he appealed to mystery? The very thing he condemns Christians for, he goes, you know, this is something beyond our rationality we can't fully comprehend. So when it comes to Islam, it's okay when things are irrational or mysterious beyond their ability to comprehend. As long as it's not something related to Christianity. Do you see the inconsistency, folks? But we're going to ponder that, for we're gonna that thought. There's no and debate. Now we're going to have questions here. We, Michael. Your, who is it, who's your question directed to? What's your question? Go. My question's for Anjum, and I'm wanting to know how he responds to... Uh, I'm, I have this right here in front of me. It's called Friends of the Apostles, and it's a complete writing of Polycarp and Ignatius. These people knew the apostles, right? And Ignatius, multiple times, refers to Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ our God. Now, why would somebody who knew the apostles intimately and died for his faith Call him our God. Okay, Sorry, Anjum. Can, can, can you repeat that question just very quickly? Michael, repeat it. Okay. Why would St. Ignatius, who knew the apostles that Jesus appointed directly, who died for his faith, make reference multiple times in his complete writings to Jesus Christ, our God? Go. You know, I would just say to you um, that... Uh, I don't accept uh, any of the apostles, uh, you know, the versions. I don't accept the Old Testament or the New Testament. So this is the simple answer to you. You know, whatever you may say, I mean, even if you said that, uh, oh, you know, John the Baptist, for example, said in the, Old, uh, in the New Testament that Jesus said that I'm God and worship me, I still don't accept it because it was not written down contemporaneously. You cannot prove any of the Old or the New Testament. And before Sam says you can't do that with the Quran, the Quran was written down contemporaneously. That's why we only have one Quran in the world. It was memorized. Whereas the Bible is not like that. You have to admit that. Therefore, all of your references and your, you know, tracing back, I'm afraid I don't accept it. This is a simple answer. You know, I, you may not like it, but that's the answer. I'm not going to start making commentary or tafsir, you know, on the Old Testament or the New Testament or some of the things you say. Because in the first place, I don't believe that they are authentic. Okay, Sam. Okay, uh, let me answer that. Uh, number one, it's a bold-faced lie to say that there's only one Quran. Because even the very traditions he presupposes to be authentic, 
In the narrations it says that the Quran was re revealed in seven arf, uh, um, harf, I'm sorry, or seven aruf. Till this day, Muslim scholars, and he's going to have to admit this, do not know exactly what Muhammad meant that the Quran was revealed in seven aruf or harf. Some say it meant dialects, some say it meant something dialects. else. But we know it cannot be dialects, and Anjum knows it, it can't be dialects. <laughs> Again, I'm not talking over you, please don't cut me off, Anjum. Right, my friend? Etiquette? al Masihu Akbar, Jesus is greater. Well, let me come back. <clears throat> he knows it can't be dialectal because there's a narration that one of the companions of Muhammad recited chapter 25 of the Quran, Surah Al-Furqan. And Umar was present and he recited it in such a different way. Umar wanted to attack him but constrained himself and afterwards dragged him by the collar of his neck and by his throat, brought him before Muhammad and says, recite chapter 25. He recited it and then Muhammad told Umar, you recite it. And he recited it differently. And then he goes, yeah, it's revealed both ways. And Umar was perplexed because both Umar and Hisham who recited it were from the same tribe, Quraysh, and spoke the same dialect. So the differences were not dialectical. But to make it even worse, Uthman ibn Affan decided to destroy six of the Aruf and standardize one without divine revelation. So even according to his traditions, he doesn't have all the Qur'ans. He has only one that one man decided to standardize. And even that has come down to us through 14 different ways. If I said that about the Bible, he would be laughing at me. But again, because it's the Quran, remember, rationality doesn't apply. It's a mystery. Allahu alam. Okay, moving on. Can I ask that, Can I ask that very quickly? Sure. Oh, uh, okay. It's up to the moderator. Yeah, because, if you want um, to do. I mean, it was in fact seven dialects, you know, because if you look, for example, when we recite uh, uh, Al Fatiha, you can say Maliki Yomidin or Maliki Yomidin. It has the same meaning. At that time, there were seven famous Mutawatir dialects. And the Quran was revealed in yeah. all of them. The angel Jibreel alayhi salam, repeated all of them. And the, the, the favored one by the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the Qurayshi dialect. It was not that Uthman bin Affan, he, uh, he rejected the others, no. But he's, he, uh, in this one, he's the one that he, uh, he, he made, uh, if you like, uh, Zaid bin Thabit, uh, if you like, write uh, and, you know, get all the parchments and uh, write it. So that would be copied and sent to the four corners of the world at that time. But it's the, it's the same Qur'an, whether it's in the, the Warash or the Quraysh, it doesn't matter, you know, which dialect. The fact is that uh, they have exactly the same meaning, it's just a different pronunciation. It doesn't okay. change the meaning at all, Sam. There's no uh, Muslim scholar will say anything like that. Okay, right, we're gonna, we're I, I guess, well, quickly, because you know, it's only forever, it's one. I guess you didn't hear what I said. I just gave you a narration where Hisham and Umar, Umar almost beat Hisham because when he cited Surah Al-Furqan, the 25th chapter, he recited so differently from what Umar learned, and it could not be dialectical. I thought I made that clear, because both Umar and Hisham spoke the same dialect. So the difference is not dialectical. I thought I was clear on that. Secondly, you just pulled a fast one on your audience. You quoted two different Qirat when you cited either the master of the Day of Judgment or the king of the Day of Judgment. You know as well as I do there's a difference between the Qirat that you have today and the Aruf. They're not the same. But you just try to pa pull a fast one on us by assuming that these Qirat are identical to the Aruf. They're not. This is why I expect you to be more honest because like I said, you've been brutally honest thus far. Please do not start twisting the truth just to score cheap debate tricks. That's beneath you, my friend. Let's, let's c bring this debate to a higher standard. Let's speak the truth, even if the truth goes against us. And remember, Jesus is the truth in the flesh. And speaking of that, we're going to want to stay on schedule here, breaking some rules by going over time. I know it's good stuff. I know we got callers, and we're going to take this next caller, Abdullah. Who is your call? Question directed Hopefully to you. Question for me. Abdullah. Hi. Um, How are you? The question is for Brother Anjum. Hi. Um, uh, the, Brother who? The question is Brother Anjum. An oh. Anjum Chaudhry. Okay. Um, the question is about Surah Al-Nur 35. Surah Al-Nur 35. As a Salafi, how would you, uh, what commentary would you choose and why you would choose that? And um, what, how can you explain that uh, to a non-Muslim? Anjum? Chapter okay. 24, yeah. verse 35. So, uh, I'm having a look at the verse here. But I didn't question. Chapter uh, Nur, verse 35. Bear with me. Oh, I see this one. Um, 
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم سد اللہ نور السماوات والارض he said that Allah is the نور of the heavens and the earth yeah obviously the word نور here means uh, many things but it is as well sifat it is uh, it means guidance as well so Allah is the one Uh, is this the is this the question that he had? He wants yeah, to ask yeah. about. I'm sorry, Lord. I did not. And I Lord, did not Lord here means that uh, you know Allah is the one. Uh, it's an attribute of Allah that Allah is the one who guides. So you know there are many there are many names and attributes of Allah. That doesn't mean that He's like your light bulb or something like this. So this is what uh, and Allah mentions about this about uh, the example is like a niche within a lamp, the lamp within a glass, and He gives Allah gives here a parable, a similitude. And that if Allah guides to his light, whom he wills, Allah presents an example for the people. So it's not a question of Allah describing himself, but Allah says that in this, uh, in this uh, parable, that he is, uh, you know, the one who guides, really. So this is the, the correct understanding of this one. Remember, look, with the asma and sifat, because Sam is correct, that I follow the nahij of the salaf. I am what you probably call a salafi. But, uh, you know, there are three things you want to uh, understand when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah. Number one, the text. We say, we uh, confirm the text, Ithbat uh, nas And the meaning, the ma'ana, we confirm the meaning as well. So he's right, you know, I believe that uh, Yadullah, you know, means the hand of Allah. But in terms of the form and the meaning, we say, be like Kaif, without to say how. And this is where we differ with uh, the Christians, you see, because you say, is actually the son, and, you know, he's flesh and blood. We never say something like that about any of the names and attributes of Allah. So we don't have this, uh, if you like, hululia, right. this anthropomorphism that you have, that uh, God is in uh, human form. We always say, be like Kaif, without to say how. And this is when we're talking about the names and attributes of Allah. We don't humanize Allah in any shape or form. Okay. okay. Uh, Go ahead, Sam. Can I respond to that? Yeah. I, I, I'm glad he said that Al-Nur, Al-Nur is one of the attributes of Allah, one of his sifat. Because he knows, according to Tawheed, Al-Asma wa sifat. The oneness of Allah's names and attributes. Al-Nur, the light, cannot be ascribed to any creature, no matter how exalted. He knows this. Lo and behold, we have Jesus claiming to be God, because notice here, John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Al-Nur. If Jesus was a Muslim, he would not dare call himself Al-Nur, because he would be preaching Tawheed. Like Anjum said, do you remember that? Anjum said, oh, he preached Tawheed? No, he didn't. Jesus identified himself as God, who's distinct from the Father and the Spirit. Because he says, I am Al-Nur, which according to his theology, is the name of Allah that cannot be given to a creature, and Jesus must be no creature if he says this. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So again, I want to thank the brother for helping me prove that the Jesus of history wasn't a Muslim, but he's the God of all Muslims, the God of all flesh. And in another verse, John 9, verses 4 to 5, John 9, 4 to 5, I must do the works of him who sent me, because he's not the father, they're distinct, while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light, al-nur of the world, al-masihu akbar, the Messiah is greater. Amen. Okay, Michael, your question is directed to who, and what is that question? Hello, yes, yeah, so my question is for Anjum. Uh, Go ahead, sir. You claim that the... Uh, Quran is the word of God, and you also claim that all the prophets, including Jesus, was Muslim. Now, the Bible itself is harmonious from Genesis to Revelation, and all the prophets before Jesus are from Abraham. All of them were his kindred and brothers. So how are we to accept the validity of the Quran, which you claim to be infallible, the perfect word of Allah, when clearly no historian, no scholar... No evidence available would ever back up that claim. Can you please explain that to me? When even Jesus himself said that salvation is from the Jews because you know not what you worship. So can you, how can we take the Quran seriously when this is obviously historically, scholarly, whatever you'd like to, to say, there's no way we can prove that. No, no one would ever, ever claim that all the prophets were Muslim, including Jesus himself. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, I'm not entirely sure if you, if you can summarize that question for me. Is he saying about the Qur'an, uh, the authenticity of the Qur'an? Is that your question? Let him summarize it again. What was it? M Michael?
if you just don't mind repeating it, because I was listening, I but think, I didn't catch the... What yeah, was me, the main point you want to make? About let, the me think, let me I think the question was, since the prophets of the Old Testament and the New Testament writings all agree they're harmonious, yeah. and Muhammad comes 600 years later and preaches a message that contradicts all of this revelation, because okay. Old New Testament agree, why then and how should we accept Muhammad as a prophet when his claims and his book contradicts all these scriptures that all agree with each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I mean, you know, this is more a question about I think about the uh, Old and New Testament as opposed to the Quran, because if you accept that uh, what you have in your hand today is some of the Torah and some of the Injil, in other words, some of the Torah and Bible, but mixed in with the teachings of uh, Paul, who used to be Saul, remember an arch enemy, uh, some of the teachings of King Constantine, and mixed together, and whatever else was added and deleted, and as you know, there are many versions of the Bible. Then it's no surprise. The Quran came in order to deal with the misconceptions and the additions and the deletions and the changes that existed. In fact, you know, after Isa alayhi salam was taken up, and therefore you will of course find differences in the Quran. The Quran was preserved, and uh, it's inimitable. And it's a challenge to mankind to do something similar. So, you know, this is inevitable. I don't see uh, any contradiction here that, you know, you know, they may have tried to uniform, uniformize, if you like, whatever the word is, you know, the scriptures that they've uh, changed in the Old and New Testament, but that doesn't uh, negate the fact that the Quran is the truth. So you should look at the Quran and then you can see what remains of the truth of the Bible and the Torah before. All right. Uh, yes. Let me respond quickly. Sure. First of all, the Quran does not tell Christians to look to the Quran to determine whether the Bible is corrupt. It's actually the reverse. Chapter 5, verse 47 of the Quran says, Let the people of the gospel judge by what God revealed in it. It doesn't say, Let the people of the gospel judge by the Quran. So he's again confusing what the Quran teaches. So if I were to follow the Quran, I would have to follow the gospel and use the gospel as my criterion to determine whether the Quran is true or not. When I look at the gospel that was available to the Christians at Muhammad's time, it's the same gospel I have today. And Muhammad fails the test. He stands condemned by the teaching of that very gospel that Muhammad himself told Christians follow, which we still have copies, which our translations are based upon, which exposes him as an antichrist. And I don't mean to be offensive to Anjum, but my religion says he's an antichrist. Whoever denies that God is the Father, Jesus is the Son, is an antichrist. 1 John 2, 22, 23. Secondly, he keeps assaulting Paul. If it's true that Paul corrupted Christianity, then again Anjum is proving the Quran is false and either Allah lied or Allah is impotent. Why? In chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, Allah makes a promise to Jesus, supposedly. Now, I don't believe these are the words of Jesus. He believes it, so he's stuck with it. Here's what Jesus, Allah supposedly told Jesus. I'll make those who follow thee superior to those who re reject faith to the day of resurrection. Allah said, those who follow you from the time I take you up till the day of resurrection, they'll be superior. Now, does the Quran record the fulfillment of this promise? Yes, 61.14. O oh, you who believe, be helpers of Allah, as Jesus, the son of Mary, said to the disciples. 61.14. Who will be my helpers of Allah? Said the disciples, we are Allah's helpers. Then a portion of the children of Israel believed, and a portion disbelieved. But we gave power to those who believed against their enemies, and they became the ones that prevailed. The Quran says Jesus' true followers prevailed, and that Allah would give them the victory from that time till the day of resurrection. If Anjum is right, Paul corrupted the message of the followers of Jesus, hijacked Christianity so that the true followers of Jesus disappeared and their message disappeared with them. That means Paul is greater than Allah because he was able to defeat Allah even though Allah said he would guarantee their victory. This is why Al-Qurtubi, Al-Qurtubi, in his commentary on 61.14, lists Paul as one of those that Allah used to spread the message of Jesus. Here. Qurtubi 61.14, his tafsir on this ayah, so you can read in Arabic. It was said that this verse, 61.14, was revealed about the apostles of Jesus. May peace and blessing be upon him. Ibn Ishaq stated that of the apostles and disciples that Jesus sent to preach, there were Peter and Paul who went to Rome. See, Qurtubi realized that if the Quran is true, then Paul must be a true messenger whom God used to spread the message of Jesus. Because if Paul corrupted Christianity, that means he nullified Allah's promise, means that Paul is greater than Allah. So he needs to join me in saying, Al-Bulus Akbar, the Paul, the apostle is greater. You can't have your cake and eat it too, my friend. Okay. We're going to move forward. We've got Christ the Way on the line. Any questions for me? Or is it all for Enjim? It's unfair. We'll Keep find out. Christ the Way, who is your question directed to? Okay. 
My, my question is actually addressed to the Muslim debater. Uh -oh. I want to clarify things. I don't want you to play Dancing with the Stars with me. I want you to conduct yourself as a man and to answer my question. My first my comment is this. Your Every question. We need your question. I'm going to answer. I'm going to give you a question. Whenever Sam Simone brings a New Testament up, you mention how it's irrelevant because you don't believe in the New Testament. My question is not about if you believe it, but do you acknowledge this particular text, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, when Jesus says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Do you acknowledge this particular passage actually exemplifying and demonstrating the deeds of Christ? Once again, here's my qualification. I'm not asking you if you believe in a text. I'm asking you if you acknowledge what the text teaches, just as much there's passages that I acknowledge teach that mom's a prophet, but I don't believe he's a prophet. Don't dance with me. Address my question. Andrew. You know, I, I don't know the text you're talking about. I haven't memorized the Bible because, uh, you know, we don't know what is authentic, that what is not. And therefore, you know, I'm not going to comment on something that you, you just plucked out of Matthew, which I said before, you know, is not authentic in the first place. So it doesn't make sense. You know, I can just make something up and I can say, well, what do you think about what's written in, uh, you know, the, I don't know, the, you know, the book of the Sikhs and then ask you to make commentary on it. You know, we know it's not authentic. So, you know, this is just uh, wrong. You know, I'm not here to give you commentary on the Bible. What I did is I, I exposed the contradictions and I, I showed you very clearly that nowhere in the Bible does it say that God, that Jesus said, I'm God or to worship me. And that closes the argument, quite frankly. And, you know, uh, you know, Sam said himself, you know, that Jesus prays to God and that Jesus is separate from God. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think really there's no real argument here. You know, I don't think we need to go into the nitty gritty of uh, a verse here from the Bible that you're quoting Matthew and to try to get my commentary on it. It doesn't make any difference to me what you think about it. Okay. Sam? Uh, okay. Now, again, if Matthew is not a revelation that God gave to Jesus with Matthew, Matthew preserved, then again, he's proving the Quran is wrong. Remember what I quoted earlier. I quoted chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, chapter 61, verse 14, because he believes in these passages. If I was debating an atheist, I would never appeal to the Quran. According to the Quran, Allah's true followers prevailed and did so from the time of Jesus' ascension, and that the followers of Jesus would be dominant till the day of resurrection. I don't think the day of resurrection has dawned upon us, do you? Because if it did, we wouldn't be here. Which means that if the Quran is true, then the true followers and their message prevailed and continues to spread. Lo and behold, what are the only documents that came from the first century from the time of Christ and his followers? The New Testament documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That means if he's right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are corruption of the message of Jesus and his followers, then the Quran is a lie. Allah never gave Jesus' followers the victory because not only did they disappear from the site, their message was replaced by a corrupt message, and that corrupt message is still spreading till this day. You can't have your cake and eat it too. If you believe in the Quran, you have to accept that the New Testament is that revelation that God preserved and gave the disciples the power to spread, which is why it's spreading till this day and will continue to spread till the day of resurrection. But if you accept but, that, you can't be a Muslim. Because let, these let documents say, please don't cut me off, I didn't cut you off. Okay. These documents say Jesus is the divine son, fully God in essence, one with the Father and the Spirit, and he's not the Father. Now you keep saying to me that I said Jesus prayed to the Father. I also said your God prays. Now I can understand a triune God praying, because that's communication and fellowship with one another, and Jesus as a man perfectly worshiping the Father. You again repeated, and I thought I made the answer clear, Jesus never said, I am God. But I thought I was clear that Jesus never said he's the Messiah, but you believe he's the Messiah. Jesus never said he's the word of Allah, but you believe he's the word of Allah. Jesus never said he's the spirit from Allah, but you believe all this, even though Jesus never said it. Why the inconsistency? You know, those things that we mentioned in the uh, Quran about the fact that uh, Isa is the Messiah, and therefore we believe it because the Quran is the inimitable word of God. But I can just say one thing to you. You know, we believe, we believe that those uh, uh, people, the disciples of Isa alayhi salam, you know, they are the best people. And the Prophet said, you know, the, the Jews and the Christians will be divided you know, into 71 and 72 sects. And uh, the majority on the hellfire, only those people who really believed at that time and followed the true teachings of Jesus, his own disciples, you know, they, we say that they are the best generation, uh, you know, of their own time and they will be in paradise, just like the true followers of Moses at that time. But after that, other prophets came 
and you know the teachings were distorted so there's a world of difference by saying that the original Injil and the people who follow that yes we believe that they are in paradise they will be in paradise but after that it was it was taken up you know it, it was not preserved on this world so I think when you read the Quran and it mentions the Injil and the Torah we're talking about the Christians at that time who follow the true teaching, teachings of Isa alayhi salam, meaning the Muslims who are, who are following exactly what we're saying today. We're not talking about the Christians nowadays who have distorted because there are many other verses of the Quran which say that they've been cursed and, you know, they will face their comeuppance on the Day of Judgment. So once again, Sam and all the people listening, embrace Islam before it's too late. Okay, okay Tim. Let, uh, let me make a response to this. Go right maybe ahead. we can end it because I don't want... It's been unfair. He's been getting all the questions. So maybe we can cut it short. But let me answer again. Again, this ignores everything I said. And I, honestly, Anjum, I'm getting tired of repeating myself. If no, you're right, getting, okay, well, uh, see, please, Anjum, don't cut me off. <laughs> Let's respect each other. I didn't cut you off, so please don't cut me off. <clears throat> if you are right, the gospel of Jesus was corrupted in later generations, then the Quran is a lie because it said the true messengers of Jesus prevailed and that their dominance remains till the day of resurrection. There is no victory for them if their message was destroyed. So that means their message must be preserved if they are victorious. After all, it's nonsensical to say they were victorious, but their message wasn't. Why did Allah make them victorious? Because of their message. So the New Testament documents must be the true revelations that God gave Jesus and through Jesus to the followers. Otherwise, the Quran is wrong. Secondly, your own Quran says none of the words of Allah can be changed. You professed and said the Torah is the word of Allah. The Zabur is the word of Allah. The Injil is the word of Allah. Chapter 6, verse 115. Perfected is the word of thy Lord in truth and justice. There is none that can change his words. It doesn't say some. His words, inclusive. That means the Torah, the Zabur, and the Gospel cannot be changed if this is true. This is again repeated in 1827. And recite that which has been revealed unto thee of the scripture of thy Lord. There is none who can change his words. Torah, Zabur, Gospel are his words. Can't be changed. In fact, interestingly, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim al Josiah, said that Muslim scholars, on the basis of 6115, argued the Torah is incorruptible because it's the word of Allah. So you're not being consistent with the best of your scholarship and the earliest of your sources. And then finally, about Matthew 2018, which you didn't address, the point of the brother was this. Jesus said, all sovereignty has been given to me in heaven and earth. Your Quran in Surah 25, 2 says, Allah has no partner in his sovereignty. Therefore, if Jesus is a Muslim, he's a bad Muslim because he's claiming something that your God says he will never give to any creature. This, this only makes sense if Jesus is no creature, which is why he has all sovereignty. And since he has all sovereignty, that means he's sovereign over you, the entire Muslim ummah, entire creation, and sovereign over Muhammad. And Jesus is Muhammad's God and Lord. And I pray that you embrace him before it's too late because it's too late for your prophet. Okay, we've got questions. We've got uh, more callers and Can we Tim. Take a break or no? Okay, we're gonna keep moving. Tim, right. <laughs> what's your Any quickly? For me? Quickly, who is it? Who is it to? And what is your question? I think I'll talk about okay, over here it's uh, four o'clock, and I need to pray. Yeah, well. he needs to pray. So let's take maybe one or two more questions, and we'll call it. All right, Tim, on. talk to us. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Yeah, kind of loud, Tim. Okay. So, um, my question is for Anjum on his assertions about the Council of Nicaea and Constantine. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I'm, I have a question. Um, so, where is, where is this historical evidence that the Council of Nicaea had anything to do with the canon of the New Testament or the divinity of Jesus? Because even uh, skeptical scholars like Bart Ehrman would highly disagree with him on this issue. Where is Let I'm him sure answer. historical evidence that uh, Nicaea had anything to do with the canon of Scripture or the divinity of Christ? Anjum, do you, do you get your question? Yeah, yeah, I got the question. I mean, you know, as I said, I refer to the um, Muslim scholars and uh, our own, uh, you know, scholars like uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, he said this, and Imam Baqilani, 4th uh, century Hijri alim. So they are the ones who said, you know, from... Um, the Council of Nicaea, 500 of the scholars agreed that John's statement is not uh, his but Paul's, in fact. And the book of John is fabricated, really, in his name. But they never accused Paul 
And in this meeting, there were many fabricated gospels. They seized 120 of them, they burned them, they rejected the gospel of Barnabas. I've been through it already with you. So, you know, um, uh, the funny thing is that uh, people refer to books written nowadays. I'm sure, you know, your friend uh, uh, Sam and others, they write books as well. You know, the other day we were debating with Jay and Don, and he was referring to a book written in 2011 as authentic about the foundation of Islam. So we always refer to books and, uh, and the things. But the problem is that uh, history is not the best arbiter of what took place because we're going to differ about things. That's why I say the standard must be the revelation. And the revelation is what is the Quran because it's inevitable. It was preserved and not like anything else. And that's why you say the gospel according to but, uh, you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, nobody believes that, uh, you know, it's from Jesus himself. And by the way, Sam, I never said the Torah and the Injil are the word of God. I believe that Allah spoke to Musa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam. But I don't believe, you know, that, that uh, there are many things written there at that time which are authentic, but not all of it is just the word of God. So I think you're incorrect there. I never said something like that. Check back at the debate. But, um, you know, we refer to our own uh, sources. So this is the answer to your question. Okay, let me answer Sam. the question then. Then, if you don't believe the Torah is the word of God, then you're not a follower of Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, because this is what he just said. After quoting Surah, Surah 6, 115, after quoting Surah 6, 115, he says this The scholar said, if the Torah was corrupted, he would not have placed it on the pillow, and he would have not have said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. This group of scholars also said, Allah said, now he's going to quote 6, 115, and the word of your Lord has been accomplished truly and justly <clears throat> there is none who can change his words and he's the hearing and the knowing now notice what he says and the Torah is Allah's word which you just denied that means you're a bad Salafi because the premier student of Ibn Taymiyyah Sheikh al-Islam was Ibn Qayyim al Jozia, and he says Muslim scholars say Torah is Allah's word so so much for that argument <clears throat> now you said a lot of things that again I don't think I need to repeat myself the Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with the canon the Council of Nicaea did not reject the Gospel of Barnabas because there was no Gospel of Barnabas. You're confusing the Gospel of Barnabas with the Epistle of Barnabas. And then finally, you beg the question. You're saying, we don't appeal to history. We appeal to the Quran because that's the revelation. No, the Quran tells Jews and Christians, don't appeal to the Quran. How many times must I quote the very Quran you're appealing to to show you? You're wrong, my friend. Chapter 5, verse 45, I'm sorry, 43 and 47 says this. Speaking to the Jews, chapter 5, verse 43, Why do they come to you, Muhammad? Why do they come to you, Muhammad, for judgment when they have the Torah? So the Quran is telling the Jews, don't come to Muhammad. Go to your Torah, wherein Allah hath delivered judgment for them. Yet even after that, they turn away. Such folk are not be the believers. Notice what you're trying to tell us to do. You Jews, don't follow the Torah. The Quran says, you better follow the Torah. And if the Jews follow your advice, that means you're making them an el enemy of your God, because your God says if they don't follow the Torah, they're unbelievers. And then again, 547. Let the people of the gospel judge by that which Allah hath revealed therein. Not in the Quran, in the gospel. Whoso judgeth not by that which Allah hath revealed, such are evil livers. You are now calling people to misguidance according to your book. You're not a da'i who's calling to guidance. You're calling to misguidance, my friend. Because you're telling me, don't judge by the gospel. Judge by the Quran. But your Quran says... Judge by the gospel, and if I don't, I'm an evildoer. So now you're sinning against your God. Notice throughout this debate, you committed shirk. You're not telling people don't follow the Quran when it commands them to follow the Bible. Why are you still a Muslim? I don't know. Embrace Jesus, my friend, I, your only hope of salvation. Okay. Can I just say one thing, actually, if you don't mind? That, uh, you know, the original uh, Torah in Injil, obviously the word of Allah, we believe, uh, was uh, something which uh, was revealed, you know, to uh, Musa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam. But uh, what you have today in the, in the Torah and the Bible may contain some of the word of Allah, but as we say, it has many distortions. And when Allah mentions in the Quran, in chapter 615, as you say, the word of Allah, which has been preserved, is talking about the Quran. He's not talking about the previous ones because we know that they have been distorted. So we need to, we need to make a distinction between what is preserved, what is not, and what is actually mentioned in the Quran. Did you guys hear the contradiction? Did you hear he just said the Torah and the Injil, obviously the word of Allah, we believe. I thought you just got done telling us you did not say the Torah is the word of Allah. Thank you for contradicting yourself. Since you now admit it and everyone heard you and it's now recorded for people to watch, you just admitted Torah, Injil, the word of Allah. Let me read to you again 6115. 
Perfected is the word of thy Lord in truth and justice. There is none that can change his words. You again go against the Quran. You are now a disbeliever. You now commit That's talking about the Quran. Please don't talk over me. No, it doesn't say the Quran. It says his right. words, inclusive, not his word, all his words, none can be changed. But the fact that you keep saying it's been changed, that means you are now a kafir, you're a disbeliever, you're outside the fall of Islam. Thank God you're not in Iraq because ISIS would have your head. Thank God you're in UK where you're safe because you keep committing kufr and shirk. May Jesus guide you out of your darkness into the light of his gospel. And then finally, you keep saying the Quran says that it's been preserved. No, it doesn't. Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verses 90 to 91. It admits that your Quran was being corrupted in the time of your prophet. Let me read it to you. Chapter 15, verses 90 to 91. Such as we send down for those who make the vision, those who tear the Quran into shreds, those who tear the Quran into shreds, something never said of the Bible, the Torah Geo, but it says it about your Quran. Okay, we're going to take another caller. I know we want to keep going, but we've got to... We're going to yeah, yeah, take at least one more. Suhair, so what is your, who is your question directed to? What's your question? Uh, it's directed to Anjim. Okay. And um, I What's your ask question? Him, yeah, I want to ask him, why doesn't he believe in, um, that God can appear in uh, the form of a human being? While he believes that God appeared before to Moses in the, the tree and uh, in the clouds, and they added something in the Quran to say that God appeared also in a stone. Uh, especially if God is one of a kind and Jesus is one of a kind and he was also they said that he was given all the things that belongs only to God that God only can do like healing let him let him power. answer okay, let him answer yes I mean the uh, answer to this question is that uh, you know Allah informs us in the Quran basically that uh, Jesus is the son of Mary, he's not the son of God. So, you know, we know from the Quran, that is our standard and our reference point. And when we say that uh, the tree can speak, it's not God speaking, that God will give the ability for the tree to speak or for, you know, a stone to speak. This is uh, something which uh, is within the power of God. But, uh, you know, you're not saying anything like that. What you're saying as a Christian is that there's more than one God. And this is basically what Sam admitted today, that Jesus is God. That the Father is God, the Spirit is God, they're completely different, you know, they're, they're completely independent, they talk to each other, they communicate with each other. You know, you believe in three gods, you're polytheists. And, you know, I think it's interesting the way Sam is making takfir as well. He said, I'm a mushrik and a kafir. You know, um, I think, uh, you know, you just got to listen to what I'm saying carefully. You need to distinguish between what you have in your hand today and the original Injil and the Torah, which you believe obviously contain the word of Allah. There's no doubt about that. But the Quran is talking about the Quran and that this has been preserved. And it talks about as well how the Jews distorted their own books before and the Christians and so on. So, you know, it's all completely there. You've got to take uh, the Quran in its whole form and not just pick and choose what you think may fit with your arguments, Sam. All right. Uh, uh, let me comment uh, on that. Yes. We, go, we go to our uh, closing one so you can go. Uh, her question was, why, didn't she, why, does, why does he reject, sorry? that God could become man or appear in human form when his own Islamic sources suggest that Allah does appear in various forms. And let me read this narration. This comes from Tirmidhi, hadith number 43. <clears throat> Ibn Abbas reported, and this by the way, all this material that I'm using in the debate is found on the website answeringislam.net and also David Wood's blog, answeringmuslims.com. Pray for our brother David Wood that God will continue to use him mightily, a great soldier of Christ. But Amen. let me read this anyway. Answeringislam.net, answeringmuslims.com. Ibn Abbas reported that the Prophet said, My Lord came to me in the best form whilst I was asleep and said, O Muhammad, do you know what the angelic assembly is disputing about? I said, I, I do not. Then Allah placed his hand between my shoulders until I felt its coolness in my chest. I felt the coolness of his hand in my chest and I became aware of what was happening in heaven and on earth. So Allah obviously takes on a human form, but in his possession, it's not even a form he takes on. Because Allah actually has a form, a body of some kind, even though it's not uh, unlike anything creation, whatever that means. Beyond that, according to chapter 27, verses 7 to 9 of the Quran, his God appeared in a tree. His God actually <clears throat> incarnate himself in a tree. Here's the ayat. 
Remember, Surah 27, 7 to 9. Remember when Moses said unto his household, Lo, I spy afar off a fire. I'll bring you glad tidings that thence, or bring to you a borrowed flame that you may warm yourselves. Now watch this. But when he reached it, the fire, he was called saying, watch, blessed whosoever is in the fire and whosoever is round about it, meaning Moses, and glorified be Allah, the Lord of the worlds. O Moses, lo, it is I, Allah, the mighty, the wise. So according to this ayat of the Quran, obviously, obviously taken from the Bible, Allah was in the fire in the tree because this fire was the fire that alighted the tree that didn't consume it. So he, he has no problem with his God entering a tree, entering fire, and his God appearing in a form, but he has a problem with God becoming flesh out of his infinite love for his creation in order to save his people from their sins. Blatantly inconsistent, if you ask me. Okay. We've got Maul on the phone. Maul, your That was the last question. He has to go pray. Okay. We have Hello. ended. Let's sneak it in. Okay. Hello. Talk to us. Hello. What's your question? Okay. Uh, my question is to Anjum. Uh, praise the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm Christian. And uh, my question is that, uh, uh, as you know, that uh, when the Quran was descended, it was descended in Makti dialogue. Uh, and, and, and this is a type of Arabic uh, without dots and without... Uh, uh, I know if he, he can understand Zayr, Zabbar, and Pesh, uh, like, uh, without any... What's your uh, question? Yeah, make it quick. We, he's got Let's to hear it. Come on. We've got to respect this we got, we got to move along. Or we're going to yeah. get to the next so call. I, I can see no, him no smiling. I can see him smiling. Yeah, and, and I can see that uh, he can answer me. Uh, so I really want to answer. Uh, and my question is that if he is now believing the current Cairo version of, of Quran, which comes with all the dots and all the uh, all, all other Zayr, Zabar, and Pesh, uh, is is it, is he not uh, like because Allah has promised in His uh, Quran that He will not let Quran change, and if He is believing another version which is already changed, so is it not some type of uh, uh, like quickly? We're what running is... out of time, brother. Quickly. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, I didn't understand move. the question, so maybe we should just uh, yeah, move to the closing. I well, understand the question. Uh, yes, he's I about the, no, he asked to go pray. Question? You want to answer? Go ahead. Do you, you understand have to the leave? question? Go ahead. I didn't understand the question. Go ahead. Do you have to leave or do you have, to, do you have time? I can answer the question here. Yeah. Okay, go okay. ahead. And then we can go closing statements. Basically, so you can uh, what, he, what he's talking about here is the vowelization and the dotting of the Quran. And what we know is that uh, in the time of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the plain drawing of the alphabet Quran was enough at that time. This is called the Rasm. And uh, uh, later on, uh, the Tashkil, the adding of the vowels happened around 65 Hijrah. And this was the first, uh, if you like, uh, stage of uh, dotting. And that was around the area of uh, Muawiyah, Ibn Abi Sufyan, and, uh, who charged Abu al-Aswad uh, uh, Du'ali to do it. And that was because uh, the people maybe no, we're not uh, pronouncing it properly to make sure there was uh, they're pronouncing it the way it was revealed to the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The second stage was the tanqid, which is the adding of the dots to the alphabet, you know, to make additions between ba, ta, tha, etc. That was in the time of Abdul Malik bin Marwan, who charged Hajar bin Yusuf to do that, and uh, this was around 85 Hijri. And the last was the tartil, which is a sign of complete vowel, like he talks about the the dhamma, fatha, kasra, etc. And uh, this was uh, uh, done uh, by Imam al Arabiya al Khalil ibn Ahmad al Farahidi, who invented this method. And basically, all of this was just to make sure, as Islam spread, even in those areas where the people didn't speak Arabic as the first language, that they could recite exactly the same way as the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It doesn't mean that the Quran was, uh, you know, standardized later. Rather, it was uh, understood well because the Sahaba understood uh, and they spoke Arabic, you know, very well. But later on when it spread, to make sure that they did it in the same way, these vowelization was there. But it's not a different Qur'an. Okay, right. we, we're going to, we, in the interest of time, Anjum, we'd, we'd like to go into our closing statement. Do you have time to give a five-minute closing statement? Let me, you know what, yeah. out of fairness, let me go first. Anjum, you can get the last five minutes. Is that okay? Okay. All right, let me start my five All minutes. Right. And then you can start the timer. I'll start, and I'll give him the last five minutes. Okay. Only fair, because he started. 
Anyway, do I begin? Go ahead. Okay, all right. Again, I just want to praise the God and Father of, of our beloved Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I, I beg the Father to forgive me if I made any mistakes in what I said, and that I pray he'll protect the audience from anything that was mistaken and error, and that he'll also remind me of the mistakes I made so I can correct it for his glory, because all truth is God's truth, and anything good we do is by his grace and his mercy, by the power of the Holy Spirit, for the glory of his beloved Son, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I also want to thank Enjem for engaging this debate. I really meant what I said earlier. I have tremendous respect for this individual for one reason. I know some people say, oh, but he's a radical and he's dangerous. At least this man is not ashamed of what his sources teach. Now imagine, saints, what would happen to him if he became a follower of the true Jesus. This man would be on fire for God. So pray for him because God is greater than his heart. And the true God who loves him more than he can imagine can bring him to the feet of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So pray for this man's conversion because his passion for Islam can be directed for, for the true God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. So pray for this man and pray that God will also stifle this man influencing people from taking Islam seriously and doing what they're doing in Iraq. Again, as, even though I said this man, I respect him. At the same time, he presents Islam as it actually is and that Islam is dangerous for humanity. And it's dangerous not just spiritually, but also physically our well-being. So may God protect people from his propaganda and bring him to repentance. With that said, let me sum up some of the things that I've covered by the grace of God. I appeal to the Quran not because I believe it's revelation, but my opponent does. If tonight I was debating an atheist or an agnostic, I would never touch the Quran because the Quran has no authority for a Muslim, I'm sorry, for an atheist agnostic. It has no authority for a Christian. It has no authority for a historian who wants to know about the historical Jesus. <clears throat> The same scholars that he cited who would call into question the New Testament documents would actually never touch the Quran when it comes to the issue of discovering who and what the historical Jesus happened to be. The Quran is far removed from the time of Jesus and doesn't contain eyewitness testimony. However, the same Quran encourages Enjem to take seriously what my scriptures teach. Contrary to what he's been saying all night long, the Quran does not attack the preservation <clears throat> accessibility and authority of the previous scriptures. The Quran everywhere presupposes that the original revelations that God had gave, given through Moses, through David, through Jesus, have been preserved and were available to the Jews and Christians at Muhammad's time so that Muhammad even exhorted them, don't come to him, judge according to their own scriptures. And that's what I did tonight. I went to the scriptures that those Christians at Muhammad's time had because we have manuscript copies of those scriptures still preserved and our Bibles are based on those, on those copies. Therefore, I, I have confidence that when I read the New Testament, I'm reading what the Christians were reading at Muhammad's time, and those documents tell me that the Jesus of history and his followers were not Muslims. They did not affirm Tawheed. They did not affirm that Allah is a singular person, not just a singular being. On the contrary, they affirm that the one God that exists is definitely the Father, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and who by His grace, through faith in Christ, is also our Father. The Quran denies that. It says, Allah of Muhammad is a father to no one, and Jesus is not His Son. Those same scriptures testify that Jesus claimed, and His followers claim that He possessed the very unique attributes, names, sovereignty, that the Quran says belongs only to God. The only way that Jesus and His followers could say that about Jesus is if they were convinced He's the divine son, the eternal son, who's not the father, not the spirit, but together with the father and spirit, exist as the one God. And again, to correct one of the misunderstandings of Anjum, he erroneously assumes that for God to be one, he has to be a singular person. Neither the Bible nor even the Quran makes such an assertion. Yes, God is one. He's one in one sense, one being, one essence, one nature. But he's more than one in another sense. There is no contradiction saying that God is one in one way, but more than one in another way, because even Enjim believes that about his God, that Allah is one in one way, his thought, his essence, but he is more than one in another way. He exists with a multiplicity of attributes. And by the way, there was an early Muslim group who said that if you say that Allah has a plurality of attributes, you are nullifying Tawheed, you're committing shirk, which is why they denied that Allah possessed attributes that were distinct from his essence, and they were called the Mutazilites. And yet Enjim doesn't agree with their logic. And by the way, they were using Greek logic to come to that conclusion. Okay. So that Enjim doesn't accept it. 
Conclusion, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. All right. A little over, but we're moving on, moving on here. We'll reset the clock. Anjum, do we, do we have five minutes? Yes, I'll have five minutes. Okay, we'll start right now. Sam, I think it was fun tonight, and uh, really it's very important to debate and discuss these things. And, um, you know, I invite you and I invite uh, the invigilator here, and I invite all the people who are listening and all the questioners. I'm sure there are many other people who want to ask me questions. Sadly, no questions for Sam, really, but... Um, you know, I invite all of you to embrace Islam. And that is the main reason why I agree to do these debates. You know, my invitation is to you to say to you, you know, declare your shahada, become Muslim before death embraces all of us. Obviously, we cannot all be correct. There can only be one truth. And that truth is the truth that has been proclaimed by every messenger of God, every prophet of God from the time of Adam alayhi salam until the final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it's very easy to become Muslim. I want to say this in case there's anybody out there who wants to embrace Islam. You just declare your own shahada. You say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. That I bear testimony that there's no one truly worthy of worship except for Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger and servant. And this is very important. And by that, you don't worship and obey and follow anyone except for Allah. And that's why we say Jesus is uh, a prophet of God the way many prophets went before. And you know, we revere him. We believe that he is uh, of immaculate birth from the Virgin Mary, that uh, he spoke in his own cradle, that he will come back one day. And uh, then people have no choice but to believe him. And, you know, we can see the signs of the day of judgment. You know, they're coming rapidly. So this could be, you know, quite soon. Who knows? The signs of the day of judgment are around us now. You know, we see them uh, uh, envelop, uh, you know, unfolding in uh, the reestablishment of the Khilafah now in the Middle East. And we see as well that, uh, you know, the hurricanes and the floods and uh, the earthquakes have increased the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. And, you know, I would say to you that there's a very unique difference between Christianity and Islam. And we're talking today about uh, Jesus not being the son of God and being a prophet. I mean, that's just one part. But, you know, every other religion, whether you're talking about Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Sikhism, etc., are spiritual beliefs. In other words, they're about which your ritual acts, your spiritual attachment to God. But Islam is different. Islam is a deen. It's a complete way of life. And you can see that it was implemented as a law and order for over 1,300 years from the time of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until 1924 when the Khilafah was dismantled. And we find again that it's been reestablished now since June 2014. And once again, the enemies are conspiring against the Islamic State. So the Islam is something that needs to be implemented as a law and order. I mean, by your own admission, Jesus came to the people of Israel. You know, he wasn't sent for the whole of mankind. I think this is even mentioned in your own Bible that you refer to. Whereas Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent for the Arab and the non-Arab, the black and the white, everyone. And uh, Islam was, the favor of Islam was completed in the time <coughs> of the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, you know, <coughs> I think, you know, um, in the time of the Prophet, the Prophet sent some, um, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sent some of his companions to the Najashi. The Najashi was a Christian king living in the time of the Prophet. And he said that he's a just king because he was judging by whatever he had left from the Torah in the Injil. And definitely there is some revelation there still. But, you know, we cannot tell. What is revelation and what is not because of the distortion? The many versions of the Bible, as we said, the changes made by Saul, uh, who became Paul and King Constantine, etc. So we're not denying that the Bible and the Torah that you have today contains some of the revelation revealed to Isa alayhi salam and to Musa alayhi salam. However, the, this is the big test for the Christians. And indeed, when we said that uh, somebody was crucified, it wasn't Jesus. It was somebody else. But, it, they, you know, this was a big test really for the Christians. And after 100 years... The true, mean, the true message of Isa alayhi salam was lost. So in this test, what I say to you, to all Christians listening, is look in the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the miracle and is the proof of the messengership of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa If you accept the Qur'an, you accept Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as a messenger, you'll accept all of the messengers of God. Muslims are the only one who accept uh, Isa alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam and of course Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the messenger of Muhammad. You know, we are the ones who accept all of the messengers. We accept all of the, all of the things which came from God. So embrace Islam, Sam. 
And uh, thank you once again for Trinity Channel and ABN Sat. It's always a pleasure to debate. And, uh, you know, we could go on forever. But uh, as Sam said, the important thing is for the truth to prevail. I may be wrong sometimes because I'm fallible, but Islam is the truth. God bless you, God sir. God bless you, Anjum. God bless you, Sam. And God bless you, viewing audience. We are, uh, I should have mentioned before, that at the beginning of our second week of our second International Christian Apologetics Marathon. And tonight, I would say, was a bit of a marathon in itself. We started a long time ago uh, this, this evening, and uh, we're still going strong, but we are going to finish up for the night. We thank you for watching and for participating and for those callers. I think we got all but one in, and we're sorry we had to rush you, but uh, we have to stay on schedule. That's the, that's the, uh, uh, the thing we have to do with live television. Uh, so we appreciate your support and your interest and continue to watch us throughout the week as we finish up this week of our Apologetics Marathon. Thank you again for our participants tonight. Donjam Chowdhury, God bless you. Sir, thank you for calling and for participating in tonight's debate and preparing for this. We know it takes a lot of your time and hopefully uh, you uh, uh, will be allowed to, at this point to pray as you had planned. And we appreciate your, uh, your uh, respect for that and your involvement. And of course, Sam. Uh, Sam Shamoon, our friend and good brother in the Lord, who has uh, uh, come to, to play tonight and brought it, and exciting to see uh, you in action, and uh, we're, I'm glad to be a part of the, the ministry uh, as we're uh, co-believers and Christians and colleagues in Christ as we move forward to further the gospel. And indeed, truth is truth, and it's God's truth, and we want to continue to proclaim it. And we will continue to do that here, but with your support, we'll do it even better. So continue to keep us in your prayers at trinitychannel.com or always call us at 248-416-1300. We're going to sign off for tonight, but remember to tune us in the remainder of this week, starting tomorrow, uh, the uh, 26th of uh, May. We'll have more programs, debates of various kinds and programs of various topics and titles. Uh, looking forward to seeing uh, more and more people and getting involved with our, with our ministry here. God bless you, and we hope to see you sometime real soon. Thank you.